this time I'll call the uh, court to order and we have somebody's microphone popped up here I'm not sure who that is all right Joe we got you so um, we have some very important business to take care of tonight and uh, before we begin I'd like to ask everyone to turn their cell phones on silent or turn them off um, we've had a uh, like I said we've had a very difficult week we've got a lot of important information that we need to pass along to uh, Pike County's residents and um, at this time um, I would like to ask uh, Commissioner Brian Booth if he would say the invocation. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, we come before you this evening, dear Lord. Lord, watch over our county, dear Heavenly Father, and watch over those Lord that's lost so much this week during the flooding, dear Heavenly Father, and touch them, dear Lord. And Lord, uh, watch over us that we do rise with them every decision we make here tonight, dear Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Madam Clerk, please uh, call the roll. Judge Jones. Present. Commissioner Robinson. Here. Commissioner Tackett. Here. Commissioner Booth. Here. We have a quorum. We already proceed. There was one little thing that's off the, uh, out of the ordinary. Um, is there a motion to approve the appointment of Penny Burke as a temporary clerk uh, in, uh, with Lisa's absence? Motion. We have motion by Commissioner Tackett. Is there a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Robertson. Any questions or discussion? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Commissioner Robertson? Yes. Commissioner Tackett? Yes. Commissioner Booth? Yes. Judge Jones? Yes. Um, at this time, I would like to ask um, Mr. Uh, Kevin Hall if he would lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you, Mr. Hall. Uh, before we begin uh, with the agenda items, <coughs> as everyone knows, this has been a very difficult week for the residents of Pike County. Uh, this is the third uh, flood disaster declaration that I have entered uh, this in the last 10 months. Uh, we had the flood last February. A lot of the same areas were uh, damaged again on Saturday. Uh, a lot of families that were impacted did not have flood insurance. And when the weather went from, you know, the 70s down to now in sub-freezing conditions this morning and with the forecast for additional cold weather over the next couple of days, a lot of these families are going to have a, a, a horrible time trying to clean up. Uh, the Big Creek Fire Department and Community Center uh, were flooded for the fourth time in the last 20 years. Uh, fortunately, even though there was considerable property damage uh, that will have a, a, a severe toll on a lot of families, there were no injuries or loss of life. And I want to personally thank the Belfry Fire Department, the Pikeville Fire Department, and all the agencies, I'm sure I'm leaving some out, uh, that worked to uh, conduct numerous uh, water rescues. Uh, nee Jackson, I'm so proud of the work that he's done. Uh, Doug and Nee spent two weeks in western Kentucky, and Nee was out uh, conducting numerous uh, water rescues in the Belfort area. And, uh, you know, it's just remarkable. It takes a lot of courage. I want to thank Doug and me and C.J. Childers. I think we had members of the Pikeville Fire Department out. Uh, you know, it just shows you how important our first responders are. There's other people that don't often get a lot of thank yous. Pike County Road Department uh, has worked diligently since Saturday afternoon to get the roads open, to get them passable. Uh, last this morning at 1, I think it was about 1.14, Fabian called me, uh, and Fabian was back out at 1 o'clock this morning because of a large oak tree that, um, that fell on Frozen. Fabian, you deserve a, a, a significant uh, word of appreciation, as do all the employees in the road department. Saturday, 
Uh, Road Department Secretary Samantha Maynard was here all day. She worked Sunday as, as well. Uh, we also would be uh, remiss if we didn't thank the employees at Mountain Water District. You know, as hard it, as the jobs for our road department employees are at times and the conditions that they have to work in, we've got employees of Mountain Water trying to fix broken lines and replace large sections of line that were just completely wiped away, particularly down the Big Creek area. And yesterday when uh, Deputy Judge Hickman and Floodplain Coordinator Jimmy Kaiser and I were over in uh, Big Creek and Pond Creek, uh, those employees were out working, and they're out working in extremely difficult and challenging conditions. Uh, the uh, linemen for Kentucky Power, we had some power outages. So those folks don't often get a word of thanks, but on behalf of the people of the county, on behalf of the fiscal court, I want to thank them. Uh, because again, this has been third storm event in 10 months. And uh, those folks deserve a, a round of applause and uh, our sincere appreciation. A little bit later in the meeting, we're gonna have Roy Sawyers to come up from Mountain Water and give us an update on the efforts to restore uh, water loss uh, to the affected areas. So um, with that being said, I'm gonna move on uh, we have uh, a matter that won't take too long, but we have Pike County Sheriff Rodney Scott here. Sheriff, would you like to come on up? Uh, we have his general term order. And Sheriff, um, I know that uh, this weekend we had numerous officers with Pike County Sheriff's Department. Yourself, we were talking on Saturday. Um, you were involved, as were many of your deputies, in terms of helping folks out. Uh, traffic control, and we want you to pass along our appreciation to the uh, employees of the Sheriff's Department as well. Thank you. Before you do anything, um, <clears throat> as you know, we lost a deputy uh, Sunday, you know, Gary Butch McCoy, long battle with cancer. Uh, he'd been a volunteer deputy for 32 years, and, uh, you know, I'd like for everybody to remember his family in prayer. Uh, I was getting ready to mention that uh, Butch was a good friend of mine. When I started practicing law as assistant county attorney almost 28 years ago, Butch, you know, I would, I, I, you know, prosecuted cases where he was the, uh, the arresting officer, the charging officer. I don't know anybody that didn't like Butch. Right. And your department has lost a lot of great people yeah. in the last few years. James Earl mm -hmm. Williams. Um, Jackie Deskins. Jackie Deskins. John Coleman, yeah. um, and uh, I, those are people that you know I learned a lot from. That uh, you know that uh, just great people that love their community. And uh, please, if you can, extend the fiscal court's sympathies to the McCoy family. And uh, we uh, we certainly are going Mitch Bush. Yeah. Mitch Bush. All right, you have the floor, sir. Please proceed. Um, this is. I, this is my budget. Uh, as you can see, not much has changed. Uh, like I spoke with the other day, my finance uh, officer will be retiring uh, the 1st of August. And I, I asked for a little extra money in our supplement so I can go ahead and hire somebody. That way they can go through a part of the tax season. If I wait, you know, till she retires to hire somebody, then they're not going to know nothing about the tax season coming up. So uh, that's about the only thing that's changed. Um, I think that uh, just th this does increase the sheriff's supplement. And let me say this, Sheriff. I think this uh, administration, these commissioners, myself, probably have been able to help the sheriff's office uh, more than, than, than probably any administration in history. The sheriff's office uh, plays such an important role, you know, school resource officers in every county high school. Uh, that should be that we can't put a price on that All right you have more certified deputies than probably any other sheriff's department east of uh, east of Lexington and the level of professionalism that we've seen from the sheriff's department is something that uh, that is well worth the investment that the court makes and we hope to be able uh, in the next fiscal year to help you with additional uh, vehicle purchases I mean people don't realize how big the county is you know, 
you're talking 888 square miles and just the cost of, to maintain and keep these vehicles on the road um, really puts a strain on your budget and we yes. want to make sure that we help you uh, you need safe patrol vehicles for your officers and we will make sure that happens thank you judge appreciate it so we have the general term order with an increase in the fiscal court supplement um, for this year and I think there's a good reason for that. The sheriff has never asked us for anything that's been unreasonable. And it would be my motion to acknowledge receipt of the Pike County Sheriff's 2022 budget uh, as set forth in the general term order. Is there a second? Second. We have a second by <coughs> Commissioner Robertson. Any other question or discussion? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Commissioner Robertson? Yes. Commissioner Tackett? Yes. Commissioner Booth? Yes. Judge Jones? Yes. Thank you, Judge. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, the other thing is, Judge, I, or Sheriff, I do need to pass a complaint on to you, uh, and I'll give you a call. I didn't make it to your office today, but I've got a complaint of some folks over in the Toler Hardy area about uh, people in their community late at night. Uh, there's been some stuff stolen over there. I'll call you after the court meeting, pass that along to you, okay, sir? Thank you. Um, I'm gonna pass over, we've got a really important presentation here in just a minute from the Pike County Historical Society, but we have uh, two uh, folks here I wanna get in and out just real quick. We have uh, Pike County Health Department Director, Tammy Riley. I've asked her to come and give us a brief update on the uh, COVID-19 situation. We are starting to see the numbers increase. It looks like we're getting ready to go into what would be considered the third search. Uh, Ms. Riley, come on up, please. Welcome, and you have the floor. Yes, ma'am. Just turn to make sure the green button. Lights on. Right, Can yes. you hear me? Yes. Good. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, I appreciate your time. I will be brief. I brought 11 slides, but I'm going to move through them fairly quickly. But at any time, if you want to stop me and ask questions, I'm more than happy to try to answer or get answers for you. So skipping the first page, the introduction of the 5C plan, um, what I wanted to show was just a real quick update about the mortality rate in the world, the nation, the state, and where we are here in Pike County. And you can see that the global mortality rate is slightly under 2%, and that drops as you look at the nation, and then the state of Kentucky is at 1.4%. So that's where those numbers are. Um, the next slide, if you look at um, a year in review, I wanted to just quickly show you where we are today on the far left, where we were a month ago today in the middle, and where we were one year ago today on the far right. You can see on the far right we had, and this was um, around the peak of um, Alpha, so about a year ago we had 3,253 cases and 33 individuals in Pike County lost directly to COVID-19. In the middle, which was one month ago, we had 210 deceased individuals. This is post Delta and 11,282 cases. And then today what you can see is that we have 227 deceased individuals, 516 active cases. But if you look at the total number of cases, 12,353, reflecting just below the global mortality rate of 1.84%. So what I'm seeing is a mortality rate closer to the world or global rate rather than the nation and the state. And we're seeing that the mortality grew by sevenfold since last year. So I just thought that year in review would be nice to just stop and reflect so that people could see how our numbers have been impacted by after Alpha, and then we saw Delta and where we are today. So the next slide, this is a graph. It shows, it's a, a picture, a visual to, to show the county kind of what we have experienced. On the far left, that's the beginning of the pandemic, March 2020, when we saw our first case in Kentucky. And then you can see that first peak, that Alpha peak, which occurred. The highest daily rate during Alpha was on January 7th, and we had 90 cases. So that's our first real peak or surge that we had in Pike County. 
And then through the summer of uh, 2021, there was a lull. And then late summer, the end of July, 1st of August, we started seeing um, an uptick in cases. And by August 25th, we saw our highest daily count of 144 cases. So that was our Delta surge, the peak of that surge. And if you look on the far right, you can see that for one thing, you see the little bump that we had after Thanksgiving, if you see that. And now what we're seeing is the Christmas, New Year's Eve um, increase. And what I suspect is this is quite possibly the beginning of our Omicron surge. In all likelihood, that's what's happening. And I'm going to probably need a bigger graph. Um, the next slide just really shows the, the daily incident rate. If you go to the state COVID website, there's a heat map there, and you can see by county what their daily incident rate, their death rate, and you can see Pike County is red. Uh, I've highlighted it, but we're red with most all other counties. And um, as of yesterday, we had a 71.8 daily incident rate per 100,000. So it's showing that we are in red, a uh, high level of transmission, you know, above 25 per day. So the next slide really shows, and I'm going to talk just for a minute about vaccinations and who's hospitalized and who's not hospitalized. So our hospitals are just now starting to see an, an additional uptick where we've seen an increase in cases since Thanksgiving. So when I looked at the cases Monday, there were 60 individuals hospitalized in our two hospitals in Pike County. But of those 60, 22 were Pike County residents, and I get their specific info, their information. So I looked at those 22. Three were vaccinated. So the remaining uh, were unvaccinated individuals. So I looked at those three, and you can see in the chart, it was a 77-year-old, a 79-year-old, and an 82-year-old. And what we know, this is, when we looked at the data over and over, we see it's primarily those hospitalized or unvaccinated. The vaccinated that are hospitalized typically you know, we're immunocompromised, elderly, and we know as we get older, we're more susceptible, you know, to break through um, and having um, immunosuppressant response to the vaccine. So on the next slide, that's uh, the next slide showing our vaccination rates. And where we are with vaccination rates is overall population, just looking at one vaccine, we're close to 57%. If you look at the fully vaccinated, we're at approximately 51%. And then the, the second, those two columns there is really showing a breakdown by age. So if you really wanted to dig in there, you can look at like age ranges. And, and what we see is that the older uh, populations more highly uh, vaccinated. They, of course, had the burden of the highest risk of a poor outcome. And I thought this was important to show because what really tells the story is you can look at the next slide, which is age distribution of COVID-19 deaths. Now this came from the state epidemiologist. He gave me permission to share. So you can see the chart on the left shows the age distribution of those who had passed directly from COVID-19 pre-Delta. And you can see, and this is for the most part, it's mostly prior to being able to be fully vaccinated. Not quite, but, but close to that date. So 74% of the deaths pre-Delta were 70 years of age and older. When we look at post-Delta, the graph on the right, that shifts, and you can see it's 49%, but look at the 50 to 69 year age range, it jumped to 40%. So what happened with Delta is that impact of uh, mortality really hit the 50 to 69 year old age group. And I think most people in Pike County are aware of that at this point. They've known someone or they know someone whose family member may be feeling that age range who had a severe outcome or the, the very worst um, outcome. And But what we found is that age was not heavily vaccinated as well when you looked at the age distribution. So I thought those numbers were all important to show. Um, I have a couple more slides, but that mostly covers the COVID-19 numbers. Um, I'm sure most people are aware that the CDC came out with some uh, revised language, which was followed by a, an update in guidance from the Kentucky Department of Public Health. So I wanted to share that. But I understand that there's been uh, some questions, some confusion over the update. Um, so we've tried to communicate on our social media, our website, answering questions. But the bottom line and my main message today to this court and to Pike County residents is this. 
nothing the CDC said in their language, nothing that the Kentucky Department of Public Health said in their language, nothing that the Pike County Health Department has said in their language would ever indicate that it would be safe to leave your home if you were sick. We've never recommended sick individuals leave their home, whether you're vaccinated or unvaccinated. I mean, that would apply even to influenza um, or other viruses. So certainly with something as deadly, with the mortality rate in Pike County slightly under 2%, would we ever recommend that sick individuals, whether they're a positive COVID patient or an exposed patient, we would never recommend that they leave their home. So the guidance was updated, and it was primarily ways for very specific populations to potentially shorten their isolation or quarantine. But those, um, those conditions were very specific and only for patients or exposed individuals who have absolutely no symptoms and can absolutely um, have 100% compliance with mask with masking. So school age children would be very difficult. I know schools are working closely with Kentucky Department of Education to determine what their guidance will be and um, health care. Their, their guidance is, is going to be you know, more strict than that. They're looking at 10 days or greater, depending on whether we're in crisis mode. But this recommendation is on our Facebook page, our website, and we still recommend as a best practice 10 days to isolate or 10 days to quarantine. Again, there's ways to shorten that if you're completely symptom-free uh, and depending on whether you're exposing you know, an elderly congregate setting or high-risk uh, population. So I just wanted to spend a minute on that, and I would be happy to answer any questions you might have about that. And then the tenth slide is just showing where we are with the influenza. I just quickly wanted to remind the public, we are seeing an uptick in influenza cases, more so than we did last year. We really didn't see a lot of flu last year. We have 74 confirmed, these are confirmed cases, lab confirmed influenza, mostly type A, and um, that's the third, high, we're the third highest county for confirmed cases in the state of Kentucky with the MMWR week 50. So the last uh, weekly update that I got put us third. Uh, only behind, and this is raw cases, not per 100,000, Jefferson County, and I believe number two was Allen County. But we have 74. Doesn't seem like that much, but those are lab confirmed. So we know it's here and it's growing. So I would really also like to you know, remind individuals that flu vaccination is very, very important right now. That, that really, I wanted to talk just for a minute about the Belfry Health Department location, but that's my COVID update. Um, did anyone have any questions for me? Uh, just one, one question. You know, there was a lot of talk about early on about COVID being no worse than the flu or a cold. Right. We didn't see a lot of flu cases last year, but more people were staying home, more people were wearing masks. Right. We're not seeing as many people masks now. And obviously, the economy is open back up. More people are going out, going to the store, going to eat, those kind of things. Uh, does the Department of Public Health think that there's a correlation in less vigilance and um, individuals taking less safety uh, precautions uh, as a reason that we're starting to see an increase in, in flu cases? Absolutely. Um uh, last year, uh, I like to quote Dr. Foddy. He said, you know, if you don't go out and play in the rain, you don't get wet. And last year, we weren't out playing in the rain, so to speak. You know, people were staying home. We were social distancing. We were more strictly uh, abiding by masking, washing our hands. We were very cognizant of that. And I do think that the public has um, s s lessened their uh, uh, awareness or paying less attention to some of, some of those uh, recommendations. But what I do know is that Pike County has led the state in influenza um, cases for quite some time, and there's a reason for that. Those are confirmed. We're not necessarily leading the state in actual cases. We're leading the state in reportable lab confirmed cases. The reason for that has to do with our hosp hospital, Pikeville Medical Center's uh, lab and how they report because rapid influenza is not reportable. Those numbers are not included. And many counties in the state of Kentucky solely rely on rapid so which is perfectly fine but it's not counted in your confirmed cases so number one I know that the lab confirmed cases in Pike County are um, 
Those are counted. They are differentiated completely, the type of testing that's done from COVID-19. Um, and, um, and the fact that we didn't add that together and the fact that we didn't see almost, I mean, it was like 30 some, I think, by the end of the influenza reporting year in Pike County, who normally leads to state, who has top of the line lab confirmed testing. That shows me we're a perfect example of the fact that mitigation worked. That's my opinion. The other thing I just want to mention briefly is, you know, in the first nine, 10, 11 months, uh, I guess depending on when we say the pandemic started, but in January of 2021, uh, the pandemic had started the previous winter. We only had 30, I say only 33 confirmed deaths. Fast forward a year later, you're up to 227, almost 200 additional deaths. And then between December 3rd of 2021 and January 3rd, the death count went up by 17. And I just think it's important for people to realize that people are still dying yes. from this virus. And in the last year, I personally know several people you know, 30s, 40, 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s who have died of this virus. Yes. You know, I just urge people to be very careful. I have a family member who has the virus right now who's triple vaccinated and made the statement to me that they're thankful that they had the vaccinations because as sick as they were, as bad as they felt, they would not want to go through this virus with uh, being unvaccinated because the outcome could have been much different. Absolutely, I've heard that story from numerous individuals. You know, and what we know about Omicron is that, you know, experts are telling us, we're not really seeing the full thrust of Omicron in Pike County yet. I think we're at the beginning of that uh, surge. But what they're telling us at the national and global level is that the disease severity is slightly less, that children do get a little more sick, that's what they're seeing but also it moves so much quicker. So I like to equate it to like two fast moving trains. So if you compare Delta to Omicron, you know, you have a train that maybe is moving 120 miles per hour and a train B is moving at 50 miles per hour. You know, the impact that they may have on say, you know, vehicles beside the road that, you know, train A is gonna move past quite a few more vehicles in the same amount of time that the train B would. So Omicron's moving faster, which means it may have less disease severity, but it's going to impact many, many more people in a much shorter amount of time, which could put a burden on our healthcare system. So w one last thing I want to mention is, you know, my, my kids, all three of them are fully vaccinated, but I understand now that the FDA has authorized the Pfizer vaccine for children under, I guess, I'm not sure. Can you tell me what the age group is that are now yes. eligible for boosters? Uh, 12, 12 and older with the Pfizer. Yeah, 12 and over with Pfizer. And, um, and then with, for the immunocompromised. So if you have a child who's immunocompromised, 12 and older uh, for uh, Moderna or Pfizer is my understanding. We, we do encourage everyone to get vaccinated. There's so much. Some of my close friends that I've you know, basically begged to get vaccinated. And uh, I really think the only way that we're going to get through this, the more people who are unvaccinated, the greater the risk that there's going to be another variant after Omicron. That's correct. And, you know, we're just playing with fire that this thing mutates to the point where the vaccines are not effective. That, that is or, the, the biggest worry. You get a, a, a variant that is much, instead of being less severity and more contagious, that's even more contagious and more deadly. Right. So, um, again, if people have questions, I assume that they can call the health department. Ab absolutely. 509-5500. You know, um, and you were talking about the, the flooding in the area at Belfry, and I've had Belfry, that area on my mind. I spoke with Commissioner Brian Booth um, briefly. 
uh, about the, the Belfry satellite clinic locations. We do have a clinic in the Belfry, Kentucky area. We sent the staff really stepped up and wanted to go over. And um, although that location has been closed due to COVID, they wanted to go over, take the mobile clinic, provide tetanus and some other vaccines to not only the, uh, the emergency you know, first responders, but the residents who are out working in floodwaters. So we did that. So I've been thinking a lot about the Belfry location. My plans have been to reopen that location, but I would urge the community, I'd like to have some conversation with Commissioner Booth about what the, the exact needs are in the Belfry um, Health Department for that area. Uh, I know we were open on Monday and Wednesdays. I'm looking at what days might be best for that area, what services they would most like to utilize there. So I know what type of staffing to maybe provide at that location. And I know Commissioner Booth, I think, is very interested in having those conversations. Yeah, when we spoke earlier, I think Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday is, would really work good. Tuesday is a high traffic area in that area on Belfry because I spoke to you. The clerk's office is open on Tuesday. The sheriff's office is up there inspecting vehicles. Uh, the seniors, the citizens is there giving out, you know, their meals and stuff and delivering their meals. So Tuesday is the highest traffic area day for okay. the Belfry area. So, I mean, that's real important. Right now it was just open. I mean, when it was open, it wasn't open on Tuesday. I think that's something right. we had talked about. That's true. You know, and they was missing out, the, you know, a good opportunity there. So uh, I, well, mean, I, I, think I appreciate that, Commissioner. And so we will communicate when we do when we get ready to reopen. In the meantime, I'll be speaking with you about maybe um, some of the needs that the community would have and need there. And we will communicate on our Facebook through the fiscal court if, if you that would be OK with you, Judge. Perfect. And um, on social media as well, that hours and what services will be provided there. And, I, and I'm hoping that the community is still interested in having those services at that location. I think they really will. You know, just knowing it would be open all the time from Monday through Wednesday right. and it's back open really be good. OK, I appreciate the time. Thank you for the support. And Thank you, ma'am. Appreciate your, your work you. and please. Uh, Again, uh, express our appreciation to all the employees of Pike County Health Department. Thank you. They appreciate it. At this time, uh, I'd like to ask Mr. Roy Sawyers from Mountain Water and Mr. Doug Tack at Pike County Emergency Management Director to come up uh, just to give us a quick update on where we are. Let me, uh, before we do that, I want to say that the Kentucky Fire Commission uh, is or has delivered a truckload of water and some other supplies to the expo center doug can talk about that in a second uh, fire commission member uh andrew scott mayor of coal run uh contacted me about that earlier today uh mayor scott has already a uh, entered a uh, emergency declaration uh he did it on saturday as did i and as did governor Bashir. mayor scott wanted me just to briefly um uh, let me give you what his uh, uh, mayor Scott said. Colburn was very hit very hard. Uh, repairs will be in the millions of dollars, according to preliminary estimates. The hardest hit areas were Kinnikinick and Cowpen, uh, both left and right forks. Uh, also had substantial damage behind Crossroads Plaza <clears throat> Way to Branch. Um, he said he did not know of an area in Colburn that did not at least have some minor damage that will require the city's attention. Uh, also damage in his uh, uh, neighborhood on Ratliff Branch in just about every holler in the city. Uh, so hopefully, uh, if any residents of Coal Run Village are listening, it's very important that uh, they contact Pike County Emergency Management. Anyone who's listening to this that's had damage to their, their residential structure or a business structure, to contact Pike County Emergency Management at 606-432-0210. Uh, in addition, the update from the American Red Cross, uh, their disaster team here in Eastern Kentucky has been in constant contact with Pike County Emergency Management assessing flood damage. Um, if anyone has been displaced from their homes and needs assistance, uh, they can contact uh, the Red Cross at 1-800-RED-CROSS, which is 800-733-2767. They are sheltering families in non-congregate overnight uh, stays. 
uh, in the Hatfield McCoy Motel in Pifel. Uh, for those folks who've had major damage to their home, and their email to me was, please do not hesitate um, to reach out if they have any questions or need assistance. We want to thank the uh, Red Cross and Miss Deborah Rainier uh, in Hazard in the Hazard office for uh, their assistance as well. Uh, before we begin, Doug, can you give us just a quick update on the assessment of damage to uh, both uh, public assets and individual uh, homes? Okay, mostly what I've got right now is individual homes. Uh, public is yet to come. We uh, have assessed 10 homes that are destroyed, 19 with major damage, 25 with minor damage and 87 affected. Affected usually means that there's water underneath the house in the duct work, the HVAC system, something like that. Um, the minor would be minor damages that can be readily repaired and they can stay in the home. Major damages, uh, foundation issues, uh, water inside the residence that's affected the walls, the floors, and so on. And uh, the 10 destroyed are mostly mobile homes of older nature and had uh, substantial water inside the residence. Now, just so the public understands, we have to have a certain number of homes that are destroyed. Is that yes, correct? That's Doug? correct. You know, have we met that threshold yet? Not quite. We need about 10 more, but we've got a stack of paper that came in today and part of yesterday we've not caught up with yet. Okay, so um, it's important, again, that if you're listening to this and your home's been damaged, mm -hmm. uh, that you contact emergency management because if we don't meet this threshold, then FEMA will not be coming in to provide uh, either low interest SBA loans or uh, non-repayable grants for individuals right. who, not, who are not eligible for SBA loans. Yes. Is that correct? That's correct. So another issue, just briefly, that I have instructed uh, Mr. Jimmy Kaiser to work on hazard mitigation grants for the impacted areas. We've already had people reaching out to us that have been flooded. Many of these uh, homes have had repetitive damage, and we're going to try to do everything we can for those families that are wanting to, uh, to relocate to other places in the county. Uh, we've done this for numerous other homes. Mm -hmm. So uh, we are continuing to work on that. So if you have questions about uh, the potential for uh, hazard mitigation grant that would buy out the uh, affected properties, you can contact Jimmy Kaiser, uh, reach him through the Pike County Judge Executive's Office at 432-6247. Again, he's the floodplain coordinator. So if anyone has any questions about that, they can reach out to Jimmy. So Doug, just uh, give us an update as soon as you can. Um, any idea if we're going to meet the state threshold, which is I think about six point six point two million. Six point two million. Any idea if that number is going to be reached yet? I don't know. Uh, there's six other counties involved, and part of that's going to be determined by how much damage they have if they meet their thresholds as well. So even if we have a number of homes that are destroyed, if the state threshold is not met, right, it's not going to qualify. That's right. Uh, you know, one of the problems that we had is the Blackberry community, particularly, was hard hit. Yes, it was. In September, uh, and that storm event did not qualify. Right. And the county has incurred substantial unbudgeted expenses if there's no hope for recovering uh, right. money from, from FEMA on. That's right. So we've got, uh, and we'll get an update on the public infrastructure uh damage from, from Mr. Little here and Mr. Sawyer. So, Doug, again, thank you and Nee for CJ for everything you've done. Thank you. Right. Mr. Sawyers, please uh, give us an update on where we are with regard to water restoration for uh, the customers of Mountain Water District. All right. <clears throat> uh, I've given you all a handout out on there showing the summary of the community in general. Uh, just kind of give the fiscal quarter an idea on how this works is you know, we had areas that had three to five inches of rain overnight, and people seen the condition of how it's affected the community, and then another one to two inches on Saturday night. And uh, 
the district uh, staff moves in and we generally start cutting off valves and working our way through the main transmission line. And we have to kind of wait till some of this water recedes in order to address overall issues, which takes a couple of days in itself. And so we work it methodically, working the main transmission lines, cutting side lines off, and working to, to get those back into play. Uh, in the meantime, we're addressing the leaks also as we can find them as the water recedes. Um, and then one of the problems you run into is depletion of water from your lines and your storage tanks. So what we're doing is we're trying to push the water the best we can on the main transmission lines and work our way through side lines and valves. And <clears throat> I've given you all a handout here showing you how it works. Uh, just to give you an idea of another problem we dealt with is that the district itself had to shut our plant down on Sunday because the river was so high from that one, two inches uh, Saturday night. And then uh, the city of Williamson, who we purchased from, had uh, went two days with the intake problem, so we were not able to purchase water from them also. So it kind of gives you, you know, we're already depleted in water there, so we were working on getting our lines filled and our tanks filled in order to get everything back uh, and moving. Uh, Judge, do you want me to go through this entirely or just? Uh, I would appreciate if you could just run through just briefly the areas where um, I can run through it. So we, we're we going to ask that Pike TV put this up as soon as possible. I've posted it on my personal Facebook page and on my uh, bit, you know, my other Facebook pages okay. as well. So if anybody wants to go look at it, I'm going to ask that Pike County Emergency Management go ahead and post it on their Facebook page as soon as they can. But, but uh, briefly, the areas, Raccoon's been restored, Forest Hills, all of Sydney's restored from Bevan School to West Road with the exception of Stratton Fork. There's a leak found on Stratton Fork, and that's been being repaired, correct? Mm -hmm. that, sh that should be done today. Uh, Big Creek has been restored. Blackberry uh, has been restored up to Hatfield Branch. Um, you're having to fill the tanks up there to get the rest of it on, correct? <clears throat> Which one? You, uh, Blackberry? Yes. Blackberry, we are in the process tonight of of filling the lines. It's going to be, Hatfield's just barely into that area. We've got probably six to seven to eight miles of line tonight that we're gradually filling the lines on Blackberry in order to start getting the depletion of the lines and the tanks that we've lost. So we'll be filling those up within the, should have everything, I hope, by uh, late tomorrow evening or first thing Thursday morning uh, being in service. So it looks like Bevan's branch of Camper has been restored. Open Fork has been restored. Mm -hmm. um, can you go ahead and tell us about the stone area? Okay, the, the, just, just for the public to know that our uh, board water advisories that we have in effect are, will be on the district's website, so they're able to look at the district's website and be able to see what we do have out for board water advisories. It is current and up to date. Uh, on the current outages right now in stone area, in the higher elevations of Straight Hollow, Runyon's Branch and uh, uh, the side hall is above the old Runyon School in Octavia Hollow. We're currently filling the lines up in that direction and, and working on uh, our uh, tank storage in that area. That area there we should have on either late evening or overnight tonight. On Blackberry, like in that one, uh, uh, that one's going to take a little longer because you're looking at six to seven miles of line we're filling that's been depleted plus the, the multiple storage tanks. So hopefully that one will be in with, within 24 hours. Right. Uh, Thompson Hollow, they should have a crew in there and, and fix that one tomorrow. Uh, Aflex, we got a crew there working right now, working on a bypass line. They're doing what we call a two-inch jumper to put the people back into service. We anticipate to, uh, this area to start filling the lines sometime tonight or first thing in the morning. Okay. Uh, Roy, if anyone's listening to this, and they have a water issue that's not on the list. I know there were some folks that complained. They, they thought Open Fork had been forgotten about, but it, it just accidentally been left off the list. Yes, it just missed, left off the list by accident. So if anybody has a water issue, 
how can they reach Mountain Water, and even if it's after hours, how do they reach Mountain Water? If they uh, call the Mountain Water District's line uh, uh, during the day, they'll get regular staff. If it's at night and it's emergency, it will go through the line and be forwarded on to our water treatment plant. And I'll go ahead and just give the water treatment plant number out right now, then call direct. Okay. And it's 606-754-4218. That's the Mountain Water District's water treatment plant directly. 754-4218. Mm-hmm. If they have any problem with water service yep. after hours. Okay. Roy, again, please uh, pass on uh, to your employees their sincere appreciation. You have crews out tonight. It's getting cold. Uh, we're, caught, we're looking at additional snowfall uh, forecast for Thursday. Mm -hmm. So uh, I don't think folks really realize how hard water line repairs are in this kind of weather. Uh, and uh, we want to, again, express our appreciation. At this point, do you have an estimate on how much the damage has been to the mountain water infrastructure? No, we'll, we'll make that assessment once everybody gets all their work orders in and we start putting compiling our data for FEMA. You think it's substantial? I would say it's pretty substantial, yes. Okay. All right. Just make sure you get with Doug on that as soon as you get the numbers together. And, uh, and the district does appreciate the comments made by the fiscal court. Uh, I'm pretty proud of the employees we have there and the effort they put into it and the pride they take into serving their community. Uh, they work hard and they try to make sure that the people are taken care of. We do appreciate you all too. Roy, could you address the uh, areas where water has been restored? What should they do about boiling the water or what precautions should they take? Now, you've got a list on here of, of boil water advisories maybe. Yes. Does that include all the areas that have been restored? Uh, it just depends on the conditions that, uh, of the repair. If you have a line that has uh, full, if it have, say it's leaking, and you're able to put a band clamp around it, that one uh, has not been harmed in any way or fashion versus you taking the repairs apart. Like In other words, you had to cut it, saw it in two, make those type of repairs. Those will be uh, boil water advisories for sure. Uh, they should be on our website and what they need to do should be posted. We also utilize the, uh, uh, the uh, what is it, rave calling, the, the numbers called to those communities also. Okay. Plus it'll be on, like I said, it's on our website. And uh, if they have any questions at all, to call. You know, one of the things that we're, we're, we're gonna look at is uh, the rave alert number. We're still trying to get people signed up for that, and we appreciate the press. Uh, we appreciate the News Express talking about that. Um, we've got to get more people signed up for that that system because um, not only to communicate about things like COVID or flood or storm events, you know, any kind of tornado warning, anything like that, but even notifications on water line uh, service restoration, uh, those kind of things, and. Um, we're going to try to do a little bit of campaign that we, we might be able to do uh, with ARPA funds to get people. You know, we, we have to be able to communicate with people about this. And uh, i tell you another thing we see pretty common with that problem is, is that you'll have people when they first come in and sign up, they may give a certain phone number, and that phone number changes throughout the years they've lived there or, or something else, and we don't have update numbers. So it's nice if they do... Uh, call into the district to update their phone numbers or contact numbers also when they expect those rave calls. Um, so we will um, definitely um, get with you. Maybe we can even use, put something on the water bills about encouraging people to sign up for the rave alert system if that's, if that's possible for us to do that. Yeah, we might be able to put in some insert in the, in the bill too. Okay, so we appreciate it. Yes, sir. And keep us updated. I'd appreciate if you could get me another update. I'll have you one tomorrow evening. All right. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. All right. Now, thank you. Uh, any questions from our commissioners? Roy, I mean, we, I'd appreciate everything y'all doing stuff and all, but one question I just, I you talking about on the rave alert. I never did get one uh, Saturday. I heard it pouring the rain, got up Saturday morning, 
flicked the TV on and seen everything showing up on radar and, and the newsman on Channel 13 was telling everybody in the Belfry and Pond Creek area to be aware in the Biggs area. And then that's when I got up and stepped outside and seen all the high water and stuff. I never did get an alert. Well, I mean, you know, the southern half of the county didn't really get a lot of rainfall. And I want to thank Commissioner Booth because he's the person that called me at about 7 o'clock in the morning and told me that there were problems developing in, uh, in the Big Creek and Pond Creek watersheds. Uh, and he was out working all day Saturday, and I think that's something that we need to mention. So we appreciate that. If there's an issue with the rave alert system, I mean, Doug can make sure we can check it. One of the issues we had is the rave alert showed, show, was showing up as a phone call from Mountain Water District. And I asked Doug to see if we can change that or find out why. Because, for instance, if somebody that lives in the city of Pikeville or in Elkhorn City that may not be a Mountain Water customer or somebody may just have their own well, uh, and they see a call from Mountain Water District, they may not take it. So, um, I, Doug, do, is that something that, that we can address? All right. Thank you. Thank you. But, you know, but when it, like I said, Commissioner Booth, when it showed up on my, it showed up as Mountain Water District. So. Until I answered, I was a little bit confused. I mean, I didn't even get nothing to say about water or anything. I just, I mean, I just heard it ringing so hard. I got up and checked the weather, seeing that Channel 13, even the Weather Channel wasn't giving much. Channel 13 was giving the most. One of the interesting things is Mr. Tackett told me that, I believe it was WOWK TV had called him Saturday morning because they thought that they had seen, had observed an area in the Biggs community they did. with that's, rotation. That's what I was watching. Oh, yeah. and they thought they had a tornado in the Biggs grapevine area and said that the radar had determined that there was debris in there. Doug, did we ever get confirmation from the National Weather Service? Okay. So. And then that's when I stepped outside and it was doing all the ringing and stuff and seeing the creek was so big. And so the National Weather Service could not confirm that. Thank you. All right, now, we have something very positive I want to talk about. I would like to ask Mr. Kevin Hall and Mr. Randall Osborne to come up. They are with the Pike County Historical Society. When I asked them to put this on the agenda, we didn't realize that we were going to be dealing with a flood event. But I wanted them to come up, and gentlemen, come on up and have a seat. A um, month or two ago, I had lunch with Randall and Kevin. I'll just tell this while they're coming up. And we talked about how we can not only work to preserve our history here, but to market Pike County and to bring attention to Pike County. And we've got a lot of history in the county. But one of the interesting things that we talked about was uh, that this will be uh, Pike County's bicentennial. Gentlemen, welcome, Kevin, Randall. And Pike County was formed in December of 1821. Is that correct, gentlemen? Uh, is that correct, Randall? It is. But it, it, go ahead. it was legislated into existence in December of 1821, but it existed only on paper. Uh, the government was actually instituted and formed in 1822. So we take that as the commemorative year for us to take the occasion to celebrate Pike County's 200th anniversary. So what when we had the meeting, <clears throat> few weeks back uh, I think we were all in agreement that in terms of commemorating the bicentennial of Pike County the appropriate time will be in 2022 exactly so um, gentlemen just begin by telling us a little bit about what the Pike County Historical Society is working on and what we can do to help and then 
what your thoughts are on what we can do to celebrate everybody's centennial. Certainly, I'll go by the way of introduction and then I'll turn it over to my partner, Kevin. I'm Randall Osborne. This is Kevin Hall, who's probably better known to most of you than I. But together we make up two thirds of the board of directors of the Pike County Historical Society. Each of you should have one of these four page handouts in front of you. I put photographs on there as eye candy to sort of grab your attention. I'll give you a short synopsis of each photograph and then this will serve as sort of the skeleton of my presentation and then I'll flesh it out just a little and put some meat on the bones. Uh, the first photograph, uh, Commissioner Tackett, this is right in your bailiwick. Actually, it uh, is closer to home than you realize. Uh, the first photograph was taken in October of 1902. It was taken uh, near the mouth of Beefide Creek on Shelby Creek of Pike County. You may look very closely at this photograph and recognize one at least famous face, that being John C. C. Mayo of Paintsville, Johnson County. Also in this photograph are folks from Pennsylvania, from Michigan, from Chicago, from banking institutions in Charleston, West Virginia, but also from Long Fork of Shelby Creek. I'm not going to go into names, but if you notice the gentleman with the banjo in his hand, that is Henry Clay Johnson. They were on his farmstead. He did not own it. He actually rented the farm from a gentleman named, common, commonly known as Marcus Greer, but his full name was Marquis de Lafayette Greer. Uh, this photograph was taken as the, or given to you as the impetus that put Pike County and Letcher County into the industrial age. These gentlemen were on a tour to survey coal rights they had purchased. They planned to develop the coal, but a couple of economic crashes and some bad luck prevented that, but the rights eventually ended up being owned by Consolidation Coal Company, and the rest of it is Pike and Letcher County history. The second photograph I chose on the bottom is the hanging of Ellison Mounts. Ellison Mounts. You may not know it, but we sit tonight in the very room where Mounts was tried and where his order of execution was read. I'm sure you've all seen the traditional photograph of the Mounts hanging, which took place on what we call Kentucky Avenue here in Pikeville. But up until a couple, three months ago, that was the only known photograph until one of our Pike County Historical Society patrons discovered a second one, the one you see here, that varies rather significantly from the first. It was published in all places in a Canadian magazine in 1932. Uh, the lady who did the story pursued it, researched it, and found that the gentleman who owned the photograph was indeed in Pikeville on the scene and who person and personally read the order for Mount's execution at the hanging. He later moved to Ottawa, became a well-respected uh, newspaper publisher, and the rest is our story on the Pike County Historical Society website. What year was that, Randy? Pardon? What year? Um, he was hanged in uh, February of 1889, I think. Um, yeah, February of 89. If you go to the second page, you'll see a top photograph of a map that was published in 1792. And the great thing about this excerpt from the full map is in the lower right-hand corner, if you look very closely running 
from top left to bottom right in that section, it says reputed silver mine. That is the first published map that ever had any indication of the legendary Jonathan Swift's silver mine. We've all heard the story. We've heard her parents and her grandparents tell the story. Several years ago, I took a personal interest and uh, decided to try to figure out for myself if there was indeed truth to it. I won't share with you my personal conclusion, but it is on the website, and it's open to the public to read and for uh, your entertainment. As the historical society, we go not only to written history, but we go also toward photographic history. We solicit photograph collections. We've been very fortunate by making contact with a lady by the name of Pamela Estep, who has a tremendous collection of Pike County photographs. And on the bottom of the second page, I share only one of those, which is a landscape photograph of Paw Paw, Kentucky from the 1920s. But to enjoy the others in Pam Estep's collection, I invite you to go to the website. The third page has a nice color photograph that was donated by a gentleman we know, or at least you should know, by the name of Roger Ratliff, who uh, is associated with Pikeville Medical Center. He's also associated with the uh, group called the Sons of the American Revolution. This photograph ties into what's called, or what was called, the Jackson-Blackburn feud that took place on Lower Johns Creek. Feud is a term or a word that draws attention, and I suspect that the word feud was tied to the Jackson-Blackburn affair simply to get popularity, to get publicity. The Jackson-Blackburn feud happened between two families during the Civil War. Uh, it was indeed a feud if you uh, consider bushwhacking, ambushing, shooting from a distance, et cetera, et cetera, to be a feud carried on by two families. Um, I invite you to read the story. Uh, there's quite a bit of research that's gone on. I have to say that my interest in this story came from a newspaper article by Henry Scaff, published in the Floyd County Times in 1952, I want to say. And I give you that because the Pike County Historical Society is not here to rewrite history, but on occasion, we find it necessary to correct history. Uh, and several of the mistakes uh, or misconceptions that uh, Henry Scaff had given in his article on the Blackburn or the Jackson Blackburn feud, I'm proud to say I helped to correct in this article that you can see on the Pike County Historical Society website. Finally, on the bottom of this page, there, you'll find a story called Conferences and Conventions, and it's the story of Colbert Cecil, the man from Pikeville who helped to start the American Civil War. Colbert Cecil was the wealthiest man in Pike County if you consider personal and real estate wealth combined. He was a Southern Democrat. He was a delegate to the 1860 National Democratic Convention. He went to Baltimore. There was a split in the Democratic Party between pro and anti-slavery, when it became a fact, a lead pipe cinch, that there would be no slavery platform in the 1860 Democratic Convention, 106 Democrats walked out of the convention, went down the street, rented their own forum, held their own convention and elected John Cabell Breckinridge of Kentucky as their presidential candidate, while the mainstream Democratic Party nominated Stephen Douglas of Illinois. 
better known as the Little Giant. And we all know how that 1860 convention ended up with future President Lincoln uh, being elected with 39% of the popular vote. Nevertheless, the upshot of my story is that Colbert Cecil of Pikeville, Kentucky was one of those 106 who walked out of the mainstream Democratic convention, held their own convention, and effectively split the Democratic Party for the 1860 convention. And this photograph I have was taken from the vantage point of this very building we're in, looking toward Division Street. And I'm sure you all here tonight remember the building that used to be on that corner. That was the site of Colbert Cecil's business during the Civil War. That building was built by Mr. Cecil within two years following the Civil War. But uh, as I said, he was a Southern Democrat. He preferred not to live under Yankee domination. He chartered a steamboat, packed up his family, took everything worthwhile that he owned and moved to Catlettsburg. If you go through Catlettsburg today, there's a McDonald's at a red light on the left. Take a left at that red light, go up the hill and you'll be in the old Catlettsburg Cemetery. There's a special sectioned off plot in that cemetery for the Cecil family who originated from Pikeville, Kentucky. The last page I'd like to share with you, I'm not going to bore you and read to you, gives you the formation and status of the Pike County Historical Society. It gives you our mission statement, but I would like you to take to heart and keep in mind that we intend to tell the story of Pike County. And 2022 being the formation of Pike County as a governmental entity, we invite you to join us in that celebration. What do we want when you ask you to join? We ask simply for cooperation. Now cooperation is a <clears throat> large tree with several branches, but that cooperation we ask from you is one, to assist us in securing funds to carry on our project. And I don't mean funds from the Pike County Fiscal Court Treasury. We intend to apply for grants. We would one day like to have a storefront to house collections to cooperate with the Pike with the Big Sandy Heritage Center Museum. But Kevin and I have already invested considerable amount of personal money just to get this thing up and running. We're not looking for reimbursement. We're looking for cooperation. Judge Jones indicated that you folks have a very diligent and most capable grant writer in-house. Two of them. Oh, two, okay, one, two. Uh, we would sincerely appreciate guidance and cooperation when it comes to writing grants for equipment such as video, audio equipment, uh, microfilm, microfish equipment, not only to record, to, but to preserve the history of Pike County. That cooperation would be most greatly appreciated. But in the short run, we ask your cooperation in helping us preserve and celebrate the bicentennial of Pike County, Kentucky. I'll be glad to answer questions as well as I can. I'll be glad to comment as well as I can. But for now, I'm gonna turn things over to my partner in crime, Kevin Hall.
Good evening. Uh, first of all, I want to apologize to the court. I'm an old Apple man, so this system is just a little bit different than what I'm accustomed to on the back button. But if you go back and, and look at some of our categories, uh, we start off with pre-statehood, of course, early statehood history of Pike County Courthouse, city, towns, and communities, and of course, basically what city, towns, and communities are, we're building on each community asset for his photos, pictures, whatever, including local history. Uh, same way with natural resources, uh, you go back into coal, salt, uh, timber, and part of my, my collection, actually in our search over the last few years, that I was able to bring a lot of the old timber companies like Yellow Poplar, Coal and Crane, and a lot of the original paperwork, you know, back to show the public, you know, how that business used to be done back then. And of course, a lot of it involves uh, local, uh, you know, ancestors of the past, you know, that were highly connected to because of, you know, the type of labor and stuff they actually done back then. But if we go back up and let's go into, uh, let's see, transportation. Scroll down. And we come into railroads. And go in and actually uh, click on to the read more button. And we originally started this piece out. We, me and Randall's been working on a Weeksbury story for a long time, but it, it fit very well. We started with actually from the construction of the CNO uh, originally in 1902. From the, the beginning, of course, it was the Big Sandy Railway. And we basically run all this back out to the eventual completion up to even Elkhorn City, going back into the later part of uh, 1907. As you can see, we've got detailed stories, history, including the original John C. C. Mail estimate that was done by P.L. Prendable, which was John C. C.'s chief engineer. Even down to the Barbone Penny, of course, what the original estimates probably cost and what they was projected at, but this was done far advance between the, uh, the metal companies coming into Eastern Kentucky back in the earlier days. Uh, we've got a list of the right-of-ways that actually was involved in the, uh, the Sandy Valley and Hillcorn Railway construction from beginning to end. And we have a series of photos, and of course some of them are actually uh, courtesy of like Letcher County Library, which is very instrumental in a lot of these photo collections. If I can just scroll down to it. And this particular photo here you're looking at actually is going through Shelby Gap, driving on to Elkhorn Creek. And of course, this was a troubled area, you know, for them during the construction because they had a massive amount of slides that occurred during the course of the time. And those steamers and stuff, they used the rail system haulage. Of course, they didn't have the courtesy of old. Uh, rock trucks or you know whatever mules because they use a lot of mule and wagon services back then too but there's none shown in these particular photos and this is looking down Shelby Gap going toward Elkhorn Creek but we're trying to do this in in very detail and try to answer any unsolved questions that you know most of the Pike County citizens you know probably want to ask or know about a little bit later on and of course, this photo here serves as two purpose. Um, this is the trussle actually crossing Elkhorn Creek. And I'll let Randall convey with you a story on this particular uh, photo right here. But you can look actually when this trussle was completed in August 24th of 1912, there's a serious amount of logging that's actually done in Elkhorn Creek at the time. And of course, most of it was provided by Yellow Poplar who held the contracts because they brought out uh, bought out Frost and Snibley back in the early 1900s. 
And of course, Devil John Wright is responsible for a couple logs that is uh, sitting in Elkhorn Creek right now. If you look closely at this photograph, we like to call it a change of culture. You have the newly constructed trestle bringing coal from Jenkins down Shelby Creek that will eventually end up fueling power plants, steel mills, etc. You have a dying industry that's shown by the accumulation of logs underneath the trussel that has accumulated probably from some of the very type of weather we had this past week. The timber industry is on the way out as a major economic force. And at this point in time, in 1912, the coal industry has nowhere to go but up. Randall, is that the bridge that was just south of Shelby Gap up there? It is. It certainly part of is. It's, part of it's still there. Part of it's still there. Yeah. If I could get Kevin to scroll on down, I want to share a, a photograph with you that uh, relates to a discussion that Mr. Downey, Kevin, and I had earlier in the afternoon about immigrant and southern labor. Here we go. That was predominant in the early coal mine industry in eastern Kentucky. This is the headstone of Joseph Zandi, who was a natural born Italian laborer. He's he is buried on Upper Elkhorn Creek. He was working on construction of the Sandy Valley and Elkhorn Railroad, which ran from the mouth of Shelby to Jenkins. The story goes from three local historians that I spoke with over the years that Joseph Zandi was helping drill through a railroad cut on Upper Elkhorn. He got a good night's sleep, came out to work about 5 o'clock one morning, unknowingly drilled through a rock face into a powder charge which had been set by the crew the evening before and immediately blew himself into pieces. This is his grave site on Upper Elkhorn. It's very hard to reach. It was originally called the Jerry Osborne Cemetery, but I think that name's been overtaken now, and there's a sign that says something to the effect of the Tackett Cemetery. Uh, but I love to tell this story because it was this very type of person, a young man who had moved from northeastern Italy, who probably spoke very broken English, if any at all, who was looking to make a better life for himself, but who eventually gave his life for the type of prosperity we know today. Back to you, Kevin. There's the grave site where Zandy is buried at. Yeah, he's, it, it's still today enclosed in a wrought iron fence. Yeah. Let's go to the back button and go back to home now. One more time. Here's another wonderful piece. This is going to actually create some curiosity. Early statehood. Uh, this is a piece that was provided to us by Fred May. And of course, Fred's been working on this project since what, 2009? Too long to tell. Too long, <laughs> but it's very instrumental. Now, I was working on the same project, but I started mine much later, and my map calculations were based on court appeals cases. And after I'd done the overlays on this, and I found out that Fred was right on the money. Fred May is a surveyor. Yep. 
draftsman, professional engineer retired who has done this type of work through his professional career. He uh, is of the May family of Prestonsburg, the May House in Prestonsburg, uh, the May family of Robinson Creek and Pike County. He takes a natural interest and he has done just an absolutely amazing job, as Kevin says, of uh, working with the early land grants and patents along the upper Big Sandy. But there's a lot of wonder of information. I mean, you know, it goes through the phases of basically land ownership. It starts off with the non-resident uh, landowners in Virginia. Of course, you had several in Pennsylvania and as well. But as we scroll back in, we get past Kentucky County, then the land laws and depreciation by you get back into Fayette County, eventually back into Bourbon. And let's click on Bourbon. And what this does, it basically fast forward us through, you know, Fred's work, but this gives the viewers a real good idea to exactly how most of the land plots were creating this to begin with. And of course, we can see the counties above, of course, Bourbon, and also we can see Lincoln, which is the contributing county off to the west of it. But as you scroll down, and this is how your, your big surveys load up. This particular area was the original survey of Murray Walker, 162,000 acres, and it was broke down individually. Now, the one where the Curse Earl is right now is a block that a, another May had on by John May. And this is not the son John May that lived on Shelby Creek, and his partner was David Ross, which is a steel man, and he had a steel operation not too far out of the Long Island, which is Holston. But this just gives you a magnitude of the overall size of the properties that were being picked up early later on. And of course, Murray Walker would keep some of these and you would have different non-resident landowners that would control like VA 7818, but also a reverend name of John Craig that eventually settled in Covenant, Kentucky. And of course, also he had a son-in-law named Cove Johnson that most people may be familiar with, but it just gives you an idea on the land expansion, even that point in time, as we, go through the years let me ask you something kevin you know there's so much history that the two of you need to be recognized for what you've done here because so many of us don't reckon don't realize the history the county has and i appreciate what you're doing to try to preserve that for my kids for future generations and um I was really amazed when we had, you know, we started looking at this, what you guys have done. And I just want, you know, I, these guys may have some questions, but you just need to tell us what we can do to help in your work to preserve our history. Okay, to sum it up, again, we're not asking for your money. What we are asking for is your cooperation. If we come to your office, if we contact you individually, if we come to a fiscal court meeting and ask for cooperation on a certain topic, a certain grant that we would like information uh, as to how it should be written or the particulars of how it should be written, we ask for your cooperation. And from the public, we also ask for cooperation. We solicit family histories. We want their personal recollections. We want their photo collections. We ask for their contributions. We want this to be a first class website. We have a couple of gentlemen who are very proficient with uh, the English language we use as our editors and proofreaders uh, before anything goes on permanently. Now I will say you'll find some mistakes now, but all those are in the process of being corrected. So what we would like from Pike County as a county from the fiscal court as a body is simply your cooperation. Judge Jones just indicated that a lot of people don't know Pike County's history. I'll sum it up with this. Years ago, my wife went to a DAR meeting. The state regent asked all the representatives to share some things about their county. 
my wife told the group that her home county had one of the largest, if not the largest, public earth moving projects in the world. She also told them that our little riverside town along the banks of Levisa Fork of the Big Sandy River was actually headquarters for a future president of the United States during early 1862. She also told them that a young man whose parents were off Long Fork of Shelby Creek, who was born in Pikeville, Kentucky, actually got one of the very first air mail contracts to deliver U.S. mail by plane in the United States. And she also told him that he was directly responsible for formation of the giant corporation called American Airlines, but that just kind of blew past them. They, they couldn't believe that. And finally, she told him that our county was home to one of the most progressive black American literary figures in the United States at the time, a lady by the name of Effie Waller Smith, who was among the first, if not the first, black published poet in America. And those four facts just amazed the assembled daughters of the American Revolution being people who were so proud of their heritage, who took pride in their history. But not very few of them, if any, could associate either one or any of the four facts that my wife brought forth about Pike County, Kentucky. We want to preserve it. We want to research it. But more than all, more than anything, we want to broaden the scope of Pike County's history in form and function. Form to add more and more to our history from our research and other people's writing and research, but also in function to make it available to people through the Pike County Historical Society website whose web address just happens to be at the top of the first page. We appreciate your time. We appreciate your invitation. Good Lord willing, this won't be the last time we'll address you, but also good Lord willing, next time we'll come forward with requests for some of that very cooperation we hope to receive from you. So, Questions, so comments, we're at your mercy. Do you all have a building that keeps all this? We do not. <clears throat> but that, ready to get be run out of our house is what it boils yeah, down to. Yeah, uh, I've when we built when my wife and I <laughs> built our home 25 years ago, she had great plans as to how she was going to decorate and what would be in each room. I said, "Give me one room. I have an upside upstairs room that I consider my library." And. Uh, the corners are literally stacked with books. I'm a Xerox person. A Xerox record is as good for me as the original. But the problem is, a paper box can only hold so many records. And a stack can only go so high. Uh, it, it is literally working out the doorway. I've collected Pike County memorabilia for years. Um, sad to say, it's hard to come by. Uh, I'm constantly, and Kevin is constantly adding things to the website. Uh, for example, I came up the other day, uh, a few weeks ago, with a campaign card for uh, Judge Dan Jack Combs when he was uh, politicking for state office. I'm sure you all remember Dan Jack. That should bring back a memory or two. Uh, but again, our history is rich. It just needs to be promoted and publicized and shared.
I'll leave you with that. So, so let me just jump in and say we're two things, three things. We're in the process of redoing our fiscal court website. When this administration came in, the county didn't even have email, believe it or not. People were using their own private email to do county business. I would love to be able, when we get this done here fairly shortly, Reggie, to be, we're, we had, we're a little bit delayed on it, but we're almost there. I'd like to be able to put a link to the Historical Society directly from the fiscal court page. Um, I can count either seven or eight generations that the Jones family has been here back early 1800s. Uh, we've been here. And, um, you know, a lot of that history is our history. It's not just the county's history. It's our family's history. And um, we, we do need to try to start, I'd like for the two of you to help us with this, working with Jeannie, uh, working with the commissioners, to come up with some ideas on how we can commemorate the 200th anniversary of the formation of the Pike County government. And um, I think we would be remiss if we didn't do that. Uh, it's sort of hard to do with, you know, now really a third surge of COVID starting. Um, Kevin, I would like to get you appointed on the board. I've been talking to Sharon, to uh, Jeannie about getting you on the board of the, uh, the uh, museum. We do have a museum here. Uh, the museum is probably cramped on space. It's in the, the uh, the third floor of the old Hall of Justice building. And uh, we're going to try to get you on there because of all the work you've done. You need to be on that board with Randall. Uh, because I do think that the museum and the historical society can work together. But I think the third piece that could come in is Pike County tourism. Uh, we've got a lot of people coming into Pike County. And I'd like to set a meeting up with the two of you. Uh, maybe we could do it at the next board meeting. Jeannie is on the board of the of the museum. She's offered to, to step aside. She would be the secretary. So so do the minutes and help with that kind of thing. But Jeannie would you know vacate her position to get Kevin on there. Uh, if you'd be willing to do that, yes, I will. So we'll 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 try to get that done at the next court meeting. Uh, assuming you get these three guys to vote for you over here, um, but. Uh, we would we would like to see Pike County Tourism work with Historical Society and the museum because there's opportunities. We've had people coming in here from all over the country, and, and they're really focused on the Hatfield-McCoy feud. The, the, the other part we've not really talked about that helps with preserving our history is the potential draw for tourism because the things you're talking about, Randall, play into how do we market Pike County for not just, we're talking about adventure tourism, but, but tourism, people coming here, uh, looking at the sites with the few. That is our probably one of our greatest claims to fame is the home of the Hatfield-McCoy view, the history that took place here in this county, in this city. And it's not been done to this point where we're trying to use the historical society and actual historical facts, uh, you know, there's things we can do working with Pike County Tourism. And I'm gonna ask Jeannie to go ahead and set a meeting up because, you know, Pike County Tourism can, you know, at the museum, but he's not on the Historical Society. So we need to get the Historical Society working with Pike County Tourism. One thing I always try to stress is that the Pike County Historical Society is not a selfish organization. We are here, we ask for cooperation, but we also intend to give cooperation. For example, we told the Daughters of the American Revolution if they will put together a list of known Revolutionary War soldiers who were living in Pike County, who lived in Pike County, etc., along with every shred of information with photos of burial sites etc all the information they can get on the revolutionary war soldiers we will give them space to post that information on our historical website 
We haven't done it yet, but, but as we work through some of the names and some of the topics that I think it's the Sloan gentleman from the city of Pikeville who has done the video presentations. Um, we intend to simply put in hot links to those video presentations. So anyone interested in further information or a visual of the topic, click on the link, watch the video. Uh, we're here to cooperate, we're here to share. Uh, believe me, if we weren't here to share, this website wouldn't be up and running today. We love to talk history, we love to share history, but we like to get other people excited in their own county history as well. The size of this thing, I mean, it's just, you know, I've worked on this, you know, I guess pretty heavy since 2012. But, you know, most of my collections uh, involve corporate history, and that's where I've been actually retrieving a lot of my information from, is corporate. And a lot of it's personal collections that's not privy to the public, but, you know, hopefully it will be. And, and most companies don't care, as long as we share it gracefully and, you know, do the best job we can possibly do. But, you know, give you an idea, uh, let's use narrow gauge railways for, for example. If you, if you dig up a narrow gauge railway and you, you plug it in, you Google it, you're gonna find the closest one is actually in Ivy, Kentucky. Act not Ivy, but yeah, Ivy Creek. And they're showing the narrow gauge run down through there. But in, in my research, I've identified 25 narrow gauge just in Pike County alone. And you get to the old steam boulders that generated the sawmills since 1878. There's 350 that goes up to about 1920. And each one of those steam boulders have a serial number, including the sawmill has a serial number. But that just gives you ability. But, you know, people own those machines. And, you know, when they get out and, and they, you know, borrowed money for oxen and just all kinds of stuff, chains, I mean, they put up their family farms just to borrow two or three hundred dollars so they can make a living and, and, and be profitable, you know, in Pike County. But, you know, it's a part of our history that that has never been told. But that's just one one instance that we can step forward. But looking at the original information that, you know, what we can basically build or side up, not counting having a, a permanent facility where we can actually display our artifacts. You know, we could easily bring the site alone up to about 200 terabytes just in original information or, or artifacts that can be displayed on the internet. And we can use that as a major draw just to get people in here. But, you know, if we get to a point where we, you know, we're able to collectively create and, and find a building large enough, say 8,000, 10,000 feet, now we can draw that bus traffic in, but we need to keep that in a situation where people are gonna walk straight off a bus into the museum or any facility that, you know, will benefit Pike County and, and its citizens. But I'm just giving you some kind of feedback or, you know, what all needs to be seen to get that started. Well, we're gonna to try to get you more involved with that, Kevin, because I mean, I know what I, it was amazing to me, the information that you were showing me when we sat down and had lunch, just everything from my family history to, I mean, there's just so much of this that I think could open people's eyes to the, you know, and I think it goes directly to, to marketing Pike County in terms of the, the tourism aspects. One last thing, and I haven't shared this with the museum board yet. I've had a lot of uh, unfortunate luck that's kept me away from the meetings for the past few meetings, but good Lord will and I intend to get back my personal dream would be a facility that would house the museum, the physical objects where folks could actually come visit, look, and get explanations of what, why, and how. The historical society would handle the virtual end of it. The tourism committee would handle the actual in the field end of it. Look at this. Someone in northern Ohio who's interested in James A. Garfield as a personality does a web search. They land on the Pike County Historical Society website. 
They read of how Garfield was headquartered here during January, February, and part of March of 1862. They decide to visit this town. They book a room in Pikeville, which brings money into the local city economy. They visit the museum, which helps the museum keep going. But then they get in touch with tourism, and tourism essentially says, oh, would you like to see where he operated? Would you like to see where he headquartered? Would you like to uh, read some of the excerpts from uh, men who actually served in Pikeville under Garfield? So, like I say, it's a continuum. It, st it would start with the website, and it would eventually end up with the economy of Pikeville, the viability of the museum, and the profitability of the Tourism Commission all being helped. That's where we are. That's where we would like to be, and that's what we propose to do. But there's good information out there that, you know, the whole county is involved, just not Pikeville. I mean, there, there's plenty out there that, you know, and until that I started looking, I just didn't realize how massive of, of material was out there that c can be collected and, and tell that story from every little, you know, end of this county. Well, Stone Heritage is a, is a perfect example of that. Exactly. Uh, you know, we need to get Stone Heritage involved because... Kevin has been up with them already. He's spoken with them. And, but I don't uh, know where they got flooded out yet or not. I had to uh, plan a visit. They, they were flooded. Uh, we were there yesterday. Uh, they did have a lot of damage, uh, substantial damage. And um, But, you know, there's so much history there. I mean, from Henry Ford to Stan, I was always told Stan Musial played baseball there. Exactly. Um, I spent some time with the late Geneva Worley over there we spent i don't know three or four hours there looking at pictures and it was amazing and, and you know in so many ways we were better off then i mean we had more vibrant communities even coal camps like virgie uh we're losing that history we're losing those communities and i think um that needs to be preserved and i'd like to get that's one group i would like to get involved with um and i think that there's a lot of potential here and again, if it if it doesn't promote tourism, we still have an obligation to preserve the history of this county. Um, I want my children and their children to be able to, if they're interested in something. Uh, and Kevin shared some information with me uh, about my family history. Uh, and we were able to take that history back even further. I worked on it with my aunt uh, last week over the over the holidays, and. Um, you know, it's sort of intriguing when you start looking back at, at, at those types of things. And uh, I'd like for those resources to be there for all Pike Counties. Well, you, meant, you mentioned Stone. Uh, we would be willing and eager to cooperate photographically or however to sharing space on our website to promote Stone Heritage. We have no problem with that. And one thing I'd like to leave you with, our uh, first presenter talked about contagion and communicable diseases. Well, history can be a disease too. When Judge Jones and Kevin and I finally confirmed our meeting time and date, we met about a quarter afternoon that afternoon, and I think it was probably three hours later when we finally walked out of the restaurant. Uh, I think the waiter was beginning to ask if we were going to take up residence there that <laughs> night or if he was going to have to run us out. Uh, and to give you living proof of it, how contagious it is, how people like to talk about it, Look at your watch and see when we started and notice the time now. I look forward to the future of our group, to the future of your group, but even more so, I look forward to uh, promoting and helping promote the history of Pike County. If you love this county, 
like I think everybody here does. We wouldn't be here. If you don't, you should. At 7.30 on a, on a Tuesday night. If you don't love Pike County, but if you do, like everybody here does, I think there's nothing but positives that can come from this. And at some point, maybe we can get the University of Pike involved. <laughs> well, that's you have somebody on the, that's know. leading indirectly to some other cooperation we're going to ask for from uh, for some help from some of you folks or powers that be from University of Kentucky. We want to do an absolute photo spread. Just briefly tell them about that real quick because I think that's interesting. Okay, that before the Fish Trap Dam and Reservoir was built. University of Kentucky spent three summer seasons with their archaeology department in the field at Fish Trap. Long story short, there were something like 60,000 plus Native American artifacts taken out of Fish Trap. Many of them are in, are in storage at the University of Kentucky today. They have no prospects to be viewed by the public. They're just in storage. They're being preserved. We would like to cooperate or get some cooperation from UK, the uh, anthropology department, to do photos of those artifacts with short descriptions of size, color, texture, purpose, etc., for our website. To give you an idea of how mind-blowing it is, when you study Native American history in Pike County, some of the pottery that was brought out of the ground from the Native American settlements at Fish Trap, Fish Trap matched almost exactly with pottery shards that had been brought out of the Monongahela and Susquehanna Valleys of Pennsylvania. Those folks weren't isolated. They traveled. They knew the country. And it's uh, part of our mission statement and purpose to uh, further document it and share it with the public. Well, whatever you need from our, and I think I can speak for the court on this, whatever you need from Sharon or Eric in terms of grants, whatever the court can do to help with your mission, I think I can speak for all of us that we want to make sure our history is preserved. Appreciate it. Uh, and I'd like to say that, again, this is not a selfish undertaking. Uh, were I not here tonight, were Kevin not here tonight in front of you speaking with you, I'd probably be reading a volume of history or uh, at 9 o'clock tonight I hope to watch uh, the continuing saga of the search for treasure on Oak Island on the History Channel. Um, I would be doing this type of thing anyway. I just, like, I just love to share it with folks who have a common interest. You know, one of the most enjoyable evenings I've had has been several years ago as I went through Randall's house. And the Civil War artifacts, the, the antiques, it's almost like a museum. At one time it was. But I the agree. one thing that stood out in my mind, being married to a doctor, was the medical equipment, the surgical equipment that Randall has that, were, that was used. During the Civil War, it was pretty primitive and pretty barbaric. It was very, uh, you took the word out of my mouth. I was going to say it was rather primitive. It was, but it's fascinating. It's absolutely fascinating. Well, I'm going to say this. I mean, I've known Kevin my whole life. I've known Mr. Randall Osborne my whole life. He was my second grade history teacher. I think Penny, did, did you have him or Mr. Blaine Atkins? And, uh, well, it was never a dull. Probably had two of had 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 the two of us, Mr. Aggins and myself, at one time or another <laughs> in one class or another. Yeah, <laughs> and it was never a dull moment. But we just got fifteen minutes a day of this. The rest of the time he had to teach from the book, <laughs> and it would have been a whole lot more fun to listen to the, the Pike County history then. Too. <laughs> so well, I, I always Tell told me. folks, and I think uh, Penny and Commissioner Tackett can agree that uh, a teacher can teach sitting outside under a, an apple or an oak tree just as well as they can teach uh, inside a sweltering classroom with no air conditioning when uh, you're more concerned with wiping the sweat off your face than you are listening to the teacher. So we did that many days and I, I'm sure both of you remember. But again, uh, were I not here tonight, 
I'd probably be doing the same thing on my own. But again, we love to share it with you, and uh, we hope for hope for progress down the road and uh, some substantial accomplishments. Jim, we appreciate you all. You're Thank more you than all. welcome. Thank you all. And Kevin, we'll, we'll work on getting because I do want to get you on that board. All right. Um, I'm going to do this second read. All right, next item on the agenda is the second reading of an amendment to the Pike County Code, Section 190, amending uh, the Pike for Pike County Museum Board Ordinance. Uh, Colonel Downey, would you please present the second reading? And then uh, we will be a motion to adopt will be in order. Judge, if I may just take a second. The presentation that they just gave, I just want to tell the people who are listening out there. My dad was big on genealogy, and he got stuck one time on my third great-grandfather. And I put in a call to Randall uh, Osborne, thinking, well, he probably knows more about Civil War stuff than anybody that I know. And I thought I'm going to at least call him. And uh, I'd say about 15 minutes later, I had a phone call back from him, and he had lo located a roster, which was we were – ultimately able to verify my great great grand great grandfather which you know tickled my dad to death because there was a question there were two downies at the time and one of them had went to california and the other one had served in the union army and he was able to verify because he had his signature in the unit that he was in he was in a cab unit uh so if any of you are really interested in history and uh you get stuck on something like that Give that gentleman a call, shoot him a message, because uh, if he can find it, he will. And uh, I think it, he enjoys it. All right, now to the why I'm really here. I get to read the second reading of the ordinance related to the amendment of Chapter 32.190, Pikeville, Pike County Museum, the City of Pikeville Code of Ordinance. It's also our ordinance number 0202125. Now, therefore, be it ordained by the city of Pikeville that the code related to Pikeville County Museum shall be amended as follows. Whereas the Hatfield and McCoy Pikeville Pike County Museum does business under the name Big Sandy Heritage Center Museum, and whereas the Hatfield and McCoy Pikeville Pike County Museum has requested that the Board of Commissioners of the city of Pikeville and the physical court of Pike County allow them to operate under this name and to allow them to make other modifications to their bylaws. Uh, this is several pages long and basically the commission, the city's already given their approval. We've read this once. We're going to give them permission to change their name, use it the way they want to, and to do their own bylaws with their directors, which is common. And this is what that boils down to. Anybody got any questions? No, sir. All right. Is there a motion to adopt um, the amendment to Pike County Code Section 190 uh, relating to the Pikeville Pike County Museum Board Ordinance? Motion. To a motion by Commissioner Booth. Is there a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Taking Any other questions or discussion? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Commissioner Robertson? Yes. Commissioner Tackett? Yes. Commissioner Booth? Yes. Judge Jones? Yes. Next item is the second reading of a proposed road ordinance adopting Acres Drive into the county road system. Uh, Mr. Little, are we ready to proceed with that? Okay. Now, uh, Colonel Downey, would you, Mr. Kane, Mr. Kane, uh, Western County Attorney Kevin Kane, if he would uh, please present the second reading of the proposed road ordinance adopting Acres Drive into the county road system. Uh, as the judge said, this is the second reading of a um, of adopting Acres Drive uh, as a county road is defined by KRS 178-0101, Section 1B. Um, if the court adopts this road, it's located in District 2. It will be for a length of 792 feet at 15 feet wide. The original reading was approved on December the 21st, and if, uh, if approved by the court on proper vote, it will be passed tonight. All right. Is there a motion to... Uh, adopt Acres Drive into the county road system. Motion. A motion by Commissioner Tackett. Is there a second? 
Second. Second by Commissioner Booth. Any other questions or discussions? Seeing that, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Commissioner Robertson? Yes. Commissioner Tackett? Yes. Commissioner Booth? Yes. Judge Jones? Yes. Next item is uh, the awarding of bids. Mr. Van, we need to take action on the, are we ready to take action on the uh, radio system for our first responders? Okay. What's the hold up on that? Yeah, you know, I believe uh, Doug worked really hard to secure a uh, more than two hundred thousand dollar reduction in the price of that uh, in the cost. Uh, Greg was able to get another eight thousand dollars knocked off of it. So, are we going to need another? We don't meet again until the eighteenth. Are we going to need a special meeting because that quote only runs to seventeenth? Is it February? So they have. So as I understand it, we do have to have a special meeting next week because the clerk's budget was not prepared. Is that correct? So we'll have to have a special meeting next week to deal with that. All right. So as long as we can get this done, that's we'll make sure we're, the original deadline was January 17th. Correct, Doug? So uh, just so the public understands, we are going to be, uh, we have tried to get grants for several years to replace the county's radio system that serves our fire departments and EMS. And we've been denied, I think, in part because of the size of the request, which you think Doug would be. So we're going to have to spend the money. We, we have seen... You know, just this year alone, three disaster declarations at the local level. We're going to have to replace this radio system or it's going to really cripple air uh, fire departments and EMS, uh, the ability they have to respond to an accident or to some type of uh, natural disaster. And uh, communication is so important. Uh, but we are going to, and I think that's good news, for our volunteer fire departments in particular, we are gonna replace that radio system. So, all right, we'll take care of that at the next, uh, at the meeting next week. Anything else, Greg? All right. Did that guy give us any information on the voting machines? Are you still, okay, what about the uh, fuel tank at the landfill? Did they ever find out when we was gonna try to get started on that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, we, we uh, I've actually received a phone call from a county judge in Western Kentucky over the voting machine issue, and uh, we had another county watching some of the stuff we did, and um, they were sharing wanted to share some information over the uh, and share their uh, uh, their bid information uh, with us that we can use in, in putting together the bid package for these I mean we're gonna go with with the uh, company that gives us the best price uh, regardless of who you know this has to be bid and that's what we're gonna do that's how this courts operate we've gone and um, the information that I was given today by this other county judge and uh, was that they were able, once they started putting the bid out and they started looking at different vendors, the prices went from about a million dollars down to 300,000 because these, uh, the, the, the basically he said it was a, a, a very competitive bidding process between the, the, the companies that were bidding. When you looked at what the initial estimate was and what the final bid number was, it was several hundred thousand dollars different. So we want to make sure we get the best price for the taxpayers. 
All right. Next item is the Pike County Road Supervisor's Report. Fabian, can you come on up, Mr. Little, and um, give us an estimate or just an overview before we uh, undertake the uh, Road Supervisor's Report and the uh, approval of the County Commissioner's recommended road maintenance work orders. Give us an update on where we are with the County Roads in light of the flood. Uh, well, Judge, honestly, we're still pretty early in the, in the cleanup phase. Uh, we're just now getting uh, the roads open where people can travel. Um, have a lot of damage, still a lot of uh, debris to be uh, to be picked up. All we've done basically is picked it, pushed it from the middle of the road over to the side of the road so a car can get by. Uh, it's just a lot of work ahead of us. How much damage since you've been road supervisor for a little more than three years in the numerous storm events we've had, is this the most significant damage to county roads? I, I don't, I would might have stopped short of saying the most significant, but it certainly uh, is up there with the top. I mean, I don't remember of any being, being any worse, but there's certainly, uh, uh, I don't, you know, it, it compares to a few. So let me, let me ask you this, a ballpark, where would you say we are in terms of the dollars of damage let's see i still have not saw it i've, I've not seen it, everything um you know oh, i would say somewhere between two to three million okay let's be conservative and say two million and that's just because i've not saw i've not seen everything but we have to take into account uh some of these roads we just black topped and we're gonna have to we're gonna have to go go over those again and you know, one of the things is we had to pick the entire cost of the storm recovery in September because it didn't qualify for federal assistance. And the road department was basically just finishing up in Blackberry. Honestly, we were we were just finishing up. Uh, we lacked uh, Big Blue Springs and Little Blue Springs, and uh, we basically would have been done, and the roads would have been ready to uh, resurface in the spring. And and now we're they're back, uh, basically going over those same roads again. And, uh, you know, obviously there's a lot of damage to Mount Waters infrastructure. There's been a lot of damage to um, county roads. State roads have had substantial damage as well. And uh, I, 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 I think, Doug, you would agree with me that in terms of public assistance, we're more likely to qualify. Okay. Well, I, can I say something? As, as I noticed yesterday in, uh, in our office, most of the calls that we got were over private drains uh, that's washed out uh, people you know trapped either either trapped in their house they can't get get the car out of the driveway or vice versa they can't get in their driveway but we got numerous it seemed like the majority of the calls we t we fielded yesterday was of that nature of private drains or bridges yeah Oh, I know, because I referred a lot of them over to you. I mean, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> it would be uh, a serious financial blow to the county mm -hmm. uh, if this is not covered by FEMA. <laughs> to have to absorb the September storm and now the uh, January storm damage would be catastrophic financially uh, to the public. Absolutely would, so, you know, uh, my budget couldn't handle it. I mean, it would break my budget, and you, and we still wouldn't, we still wouldn't be finished. I mean, Blackberry is as it was. It is, it is. See, that's what I was saying, and honestly, uh, it's kind of I don't know. I kind of got lulled into that, I think, but. The, the Phelps area was hit a lot worse than what I initially thought that it was. I thought all the damage was, you know, kind of up in Pence and uh, in, in Belfry area. But then, you know, as the calls came in, uh, like you said, Chapman Fork, uh, Lower Elk, uh, Woodman, all these areas there, they, they were hit pretty hard again, just about as hard as they were the last flood. Smith Fork, yeah, Smith again, Fork. got Big Blue Springs, Little Blue Springs wasn't as bad, uh, Pound the Mill. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah we still, that's what I was saying, you know, Phelps at first, uh, 
I would, I thought that all the damage was going to be, con, you know, mostly in the Belfry area, but I was wrong. Like I said, Phelps, uh, we got well, camper. Commissioner Booth, both his, both his areas were, were hit hard. Yeah, Camper, Palm Fort, Meat House. Well, um, we're going to do everything we can to, to make sure that that we qualify for mm -hmm. the um, FEMA declaration. I don't see how we wouldn't. Well, I, I, I did. I did talk Doug to uh, Mayor Scott today. He thinks that they've got probably a couple million dollars in damage. So, uh, so I mean, I mean, Doug, you, does that six million statewide? What if we have six million here in Pike County? Six point. Okay. Well. When you throw in the state roads, it may very well. So. Well, you. Look, I mean, Blackberry is their state roads. Has yeah. already was tore up. Now they're tore up even more. Doug, is there a way to roll these two storm events in together, in terms of? Can you can you find that out? Because I mean. I talked to a state highway department official who indicated that's what they were going to try to do. So I don't know if it's possible or not, but if we can, we, you know, that might give us some help and you, on the phone. You know, we're talking, I, I know we're talking about Commissioner Booth, but, you know, Commissioner Robertson, uh, he, he took on quite a bit of damage himself uh, in, in, his, in his district. Uh, you can't, you know, Pike Floyd Hollow, Mara Creek again, both Even of those. Had, had, I think you had damage on Kendrick Fork, didn't you? Had damage, yeah. Uh, it's Kendrick Fork. Uh, Made us you winds branch black uh, bottom flooded as I was, as y'all mentioned earlier open fork uh, knob fork a lot of damage yeah they, uh, I think Scott Fork wasn't it yeah I got up Saturday and checked around in District Two and then contacted Commissioner Booth and Commissioner Ronnie and Fabian the judge and. Went to drive well, the funny thing was, is when the judge had, uh, had contacted me, I, I got up. I live on a hill. I can look down at my creek, and uh, I look down, and mine's clear. And I think I made that contact. I made yeah, a comment yeah. to him. I said, Judge, my, my, my creek's clear. And they're flooding. Commissioner Booth called me. I called Fabian. Fabian says, it's not even really, the creek's not even up over here. Uh, it wasn't. I mean, it was still clear, honestly. I looked down, the creek was running clear at, at my house. It's crazy weather events, but anyway. And uh, I'd say you might as well. I got two or three phone calls today from AFLAX and Burnwell. Uh, the Sheriff's Department contacted me today about color hauler. They said that the blacktop, the water just come down third and just literally lift the blacktop up in color hauler. See, and I'm not aware of, I don't, I'm not aware of that. He just reported. called me right before I walked in the courthouse and you was, I mm -hmm. went there and talked to Jenny a minute. Next time I know y'all was in the back of her. But yeah. I mean, when you've got a thousand miles of county roads. Uh, and we do re rely, I mean, I rely a lot on people because, look, Commissioner Booth, like you said, Commissioner Tackett, Mr. You, you, even yourself, have all been over in the area. And Commissioner Booth has run ever since I Saturday. Run He's running roads Saturday and roads and roads. Sunday. And, you know, you still you just can't hit them all. Even without, I mean, it, it's hard to hit all of them. So we do uh, re rely a lot in road department on on the people living in the hollows to call and report the and, damage. And one of the things that I've encouraged people who message me or call me is to be patient because <laughs> the first priority is to get the roads open That's so it. people can get in and out. Yes, the repairs are going to take time. Um, I just had a lady message me over a problem of of, of a. Uh, retaining wall failure on winds branch uh -huh. and you know those things are going to have hopefully be covered by fema so you're talking months to get approval and to get the work done we <clears throat> we looked today before the court meeting we put on 120 work orders since saturday that's uh that's a lot of that's a lot of complaints coming in you know it's a lot of work orders i mean 100 120 work orders um, those are all separate roads too. This is not duplicate roads. That's what I'm saying. These, these are not duplicate roads. Like you, 
open one drain and then you put on another work order to open a drain five miles the road. That's not what we're doing. All of these are are uh, so separate hollows. Different roads impacted. Yes. And some of the roads are going to have multiple problems to be fixed. Yeah, there's not just one. Yeah, well, honestly, that this never happens. Yeah, it's just not you just run in and fix one drain. It's it's there's multiple things to do in that hollow when you go in. And that's like you said back to being patient. It does take time. Uh, it takes a while. We've got limited men uh just one shift. You know, everybody I was thinking about today, you know, every every one of us you know, you've got a, a point where you're just not productive anymore. And you have to kind of, you know, you get so tired, you're just not productive, and then you run the risk of, of hurting someone. You were out to three, and I called you at five. Or, or I'm sorry, I called you at a uh, little after seven this morning. Yeah, yeah. So. I never did the Saturday at 1230, dreaming I'd be uh, standing in the middle of 119 at Belfry and see, uh, I think me and – me and Mr. Jackson, he was standing there, and here comes a six foot wave up the <laughs> back towards Pipe One One Nineteen. I mean, it's, you know, and they and they were some people that wasn't they, they was disrespectful the way they done, but you know, Nee done a great job, and we got it shut down. And, well, Nee may speak. I had to, you know, a lot of people over there said that that's the highest they've seen the water. Yeah. Oh, across the four lane that they had, it was the most to, water. It was saw. back to the old football field. Yeah, yes. and they said they hadn't saw that before. Is that? Is that something you saw, Nee? Yeah. And, and it left a, it left a mess. And you asked me w uh, to check on that drain at Octavia Bruce Hatfields if that water line was dead, mm -hmm. and I did check; it is dead. Yeah. See, and that's a that's a, a, a drain that we have to replace there. I mean, it, it won't take long to for the cost to add up. That's the reason I, I hate to. Because I don't know that number, I don't have a good hard number. I hate to throw it out there because uh, it could be higher than what I'm saying. There's a lot of damage in that ditch right in front of Bruce's house. Is that what you're talking about? Well, the, the main it's, creek drain that crosses there is has got to be replaced. It, it had the water line run through the middle of it, mountain water come and moved it. And, and we, we wasn't aware that they had moved. I wasn't aware that it was a dead line, uh, so we kind of worked around it to try to get that open and. Uh, uh, but then Commissioner Booth, had, they had rerun the line. I want to mention something. We need to ask Mountain Water to map when they relocate a line or they do work. We need to ask them to try to, on a map, mark it. Mm -hmm. Because when a lot of these water lines were put in, they never mapped the actual location. So on Pico Hollow, we had mountain water come over. We were changing a drain out. And they done great, by the way. They did do great, but you're exactly right. Mountain water, we had them there in case there was a problem. They identified where they thought the water line was. Mm -hmm. When the road department starts working, it was not where they thought it was, and we ended up with a line break. Yeah. So, I mean, it's when, when we go out to do work as the county, a lot of times our crews are having to guess, as are the mountain water crews, where the lines actually are. Is that a fair statement? It's very fair. And we were, and honestly, you know, Commissioner Booth, I'll tell you this, you rely a lot on your older guys who have been there for years, and they know before, by the prior knowledge where a water line is because you've busted it in that spot before. You know, you, so when you go in to open a drain that stopped up, you know, you rely on someone saying, oh, wait, I remember – Two years ago, we was doing the same thing and busted the water line. It runs right in front of the right in front of the drain. Because in Pop Yard Holler, when I replaced them drains in Pop Yard Holler on Big Creek, the water line runs on top of the drains. We actually dug the drains out, pulled them out, and slid the new drains back underneath the water line. They're above the drains in the middle of the road. Well, I think that's what happened to us on Open Fort too, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. Just it's something that just there was no. Th when those lines were put in, there was no thought to dig out a drain. And when you hit a creek crossing, you don't really think about it. have no idea where they're at. Yeah. All right. Is we have the we have the uh, county commissioners recommended road maintenance work orders. Is there a motion to approve? Motion. motion by Commissioner Tackett. Is there a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Robertson. Any other questions or discussion? Seeing them, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Commissioner Robertson? Yes. Commissioner Tackett? Yes. Commissioner Booth? Yes. Judge Jones? 
Uh, yes. All right. Um, next item is treasurer's business. And uh, we're going to try to run through this real quick. Do we have need for executive session? Okay. All right, let's move through this. Uh, Mr. Stacy, please proceed. Authorize the following interfund transfer for December 2021 to transfer $1,896,854 from the general fund to the road fund. Is there a motion to authorize? Motion. Motion by Commissioner Booth. Is there a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Tackett. Any other questions or discussion? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Commissioner Robertson? Yes. Commissioner Tackett? Yes. Commissioner Booth? Yes. Judge Jones? Yes. Acknowledge receipt of the Treasurer's financial statement for the month ending December 31st, 2021. Is there a motion to acknowledge receipt of the Treasurer's financial statement for the month ending December 31st, 2021? Motion. Motion by Commissioner Booth. Is there a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Robertson. Any other questions or discussion? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Commissioner Robertson? Yes. Commissioner Tackett? Yes. Commissioner Booth? Yes. Judge Jones? Yes. <clears throat> Authorize an ACH payment to the Kentucky Board of Veter Veterinary Examiners for three 2022 euthanasia license renewals for the Pike County Animal Shelter. It'd be $50 each. It'd be a total of $150 plus processing fees. Is there a motion to authorize the ACH payment to the Kentucky Board of Veterinary Examiners uh, for the license renewals as specified by the treasurer? Uh, $50 each for a total of 150 plus processing fees. Motion. Motion by Commissioner Robertson. Is there a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Tack. Any other questions or discussion? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Commissioner Robertson? Yes. Commissioner Tackett? Yes. Commissioner Booth? Yes. Judge Jones? Yes. Authorize a check to the consolidated account from the ARPA fund account for the Pike County revenue loss calculation amount certified by Compass Municipal Advisors and Sturgill Turner PLLC. Is there a motion to authorize a check for the transfer uh, when it is certified? Motion. Motion by Commissioner Booth. Is there a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Tackett. Any other questions or discussion? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Commissioner Robertson? Yes. Commissioner Tackett? Yes. Commissioner Booth? Yes. Judge Jones? Yes. Authorize a standing order to pay disbursement request forms from the ARPA fund to Compass Municipal Advisors and Sturgill Turnal PLLC uh, once received per contract terms of 1.5% of expended amounts. Is there a motion to approve? Motion. Motion by Commissioner Booth. Is there a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Robertson. Any other question or discussion? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Commissioner Robertson? Yes. Commissioner Tackett? Yes. Commissioner Booth? Yes. Judge Jones? Yes. Authorize a check to the University of Kentucky in the amount of $380 for registration fee for uh, Thomas Thacker and Bradley Tackett to attend two online classes for the Roadmaster program on January 12th and 13th. Is there a motion to authorize as specified by the Treasurer? Motion. Motion by Commissioner Booth. Is there a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Taggart. Any other questions or discussion? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Commissioner Robertson? Yes. Commissioner Taggart? Yes. Commissioner Booth? Yes. Judge Jones? Yes. <clears throat> Last thing I have is to authorize checks for lodging, registration, and expenses for any employee who needs to attend the Kentucky uh, Better Transportation 44th Transportation Conference, which would be January 19th through the 21st at the Galt House in Louisville, Kentucky. Is there a motion to authorize? Motion. Motion by Commissioner Tackett. Is there a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Booth. Any other questions or discussion? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Commissioner Robertson? Yes. Commissioner Tackett? Yes. Commissioner Booth? Yes. Judge Jones? Yes. Next item is the uh, Mr. Mr. Stacy. Any other business? I'm finished. All right, Judge. Uh, we do have need for executive session. I'd like to ask County Attorney Kevin King to please instruct the court and the public on the relevant provisions of the Kentucky Open Meeting Law as it pertains to the entry by a legislative body into executive session. We'll need a motion and vote under KRS 61810, subsection C and F, to discuss ongoing uh, litigation and specific personnel matters. Is there a motion to enter into executive session? Motion. Motion by Commissioner Robertson. Is there a second? Second. 
Second by Commissioner Tackett. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Commissioner Robertson? Yes. Commissioner Tackett? Yes. Commissioner Booth? Yes. Judge Jones? Yes. We will stand in recess uh, for the purpose of executive session and we'll return to call of the chair. All right. Is there a motion to adjourn from executive session? Motion. We have a motion by Commissioner Robertson, second by me. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Commissioner Robertson? Yes. Commissioner Tackett? Yes. Commissioner Booth? Yes. Judge Jones? Yes. Um, all right. We don't have any personnel uh, matters to take up directly um, until Mr. Maynard gets back. Um, so now I'm going to go to department supervisor's comments. Mr. Fan, anything? Sherry, anything? Anything from the animal shelter, Ms. Goff? Senior citizens, anything from senior citizens? I got a few questions for you, too. I just wanted to ask the public and the court would you all please remember the employees of the Senior Citizens Program in your prayers? Especially my home delivered meal drivers. Um, they, they need your prayers, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Got one question then. How is, uh, how's everything on the food the end of it now? Are we, they getting in pretty much what they need or? Well, it depends. Sometimes we do, and then sometimes we'll be half and some, half. Is that something we're locked into, or can we, uh, no. you know? I mean, I'm, the, I could change distributors, but I can't. I have to stick to the menu. Just one. Yeah. I, I guess what I was saying is your menu that you've done made over the last couple of years, if you're short something, you know what I'm saying? That right. was, are there another company that we could... They can get it Again, from too. Well, I've already checked on that. But it's all five counties is going through the same thing. Okay. Most of the time, if it's something that's sitting on a ship out in the ocean, it's uh, everybody's short with it, not just us. Have we heard anything on our Pipeful Senior Citizens, how it's going? Or um, that, that's, that's something that's a – I want Gary <laughs> to come up and talk about that here in a minute. Okay, he can have my seat. <laughs> Thank you, Diane. Eric, come on up just real quick. Let's talk about Pike for Senior Citizens. Thank you all. And while Thank we're doing it, Sharon, you have anything? Okay. Jerry, anything from Trails? Anything from Finance or Solid Waste? Talked about the roads. Paul, anything from Public Works? William, anything from Safety? All right. Eric, give me a quick update on where we are with the uh, uh, architect procurement. Yeah, the, the architect has been procured. Um, we advertised it in the local paper and I sent out letters to five individual architectural firms. Only one responded, which is um, REB Architects out of Nicholsville. I've worked with them in the past uh, on several early housing projects. Um, one locally, they were the firm that designed the uh, Blackberry Senior Assistance uh, early housing project over next to Lover's Lane. And they did one for me in Inez and one in Louisa. So I have a history with these guys. They're good architects. So um, the committee got together, went through the motions of scoring it, selected them, and uh, they will be here. The architect, Bob Burge, is the principal architect. He will be here next Wednesday to go do a walkthrough uh, of the current building and just assess, meet, uh, meet with Diane to see what her needs are and put together a uh, preliminary design and a cost estimate. How will he, how is the architect firm pay? Are they paid a percentage? That, well, unlike an engineer on a water or sewer project, they're just basically paid a flat fee, and that's a negotiable fee between the owner and the architect of how much they'll charge. Well, that's, I mean, that, that's before we go any further. We need to know what the charge is going to be. Yeah, but and but then we, he, in order to, to base a charge, he's got to do He's got to do a preliminary cost estimate and a preliminary design to see how much it's going to cost to base his fee. We need to make sure that we go as far to the, toward that property line as possible. Yeah. And I mean, I mean, I want this thing moving quick because 
I mean, right now it's not as urgent because the senior citizens are not open to public use. But when this pandemic does free up and we can get people back in it, uh, we do have to get the city's permission or approval of the design right. because it's their building. And uh, so I do want to speed this up and, and yeah, let we'll, the folks know that we are still working on yeah, it. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll try to get a cost estimate things together. I guess then the big thing after that is how we're going to fund it. Let's try to find out who, how we're going to fund it. Because right now, a CDB with, with community development, development block grant we have the county has an open project which is west care and until why the is that not closed out pandemic uh -huh. the pandemic they've not been able to get out and monitor the projects we need to do to whoever we need to talk to to get cdbg closed out well we have we have talked to commissioner king's office we've talked to uh billy renee to try to get that done until that west care project exact is monitored and closed out Pike County is not eligible to apply for another block grant project. Now that pro those applications are not due until August of well, next year. I'll make a phone call next week to Commissioner uh, King. Yeah, and then you know Pikeville is in the same boat. You know I mean, uh, they have an open project uh, on the broadband technology building over beside of the uh, Technic uh, Community Technical College building. Theirs is open too, um, so they can't apply until. That was closed out also. All right, appreciate it. All right. All right. Uh, Mr. Kaiser, anything from floodplain? Doug, Nick, can you all come up for one second real quick? Um, uh, one thing we're talking about doing is either Thursday or Friday, doing a press conference to bring so that way we can update the public on where we are in terms of uh, the assessments okay and where we are in terms of the state threshold numbers um, also we hope to be able to give an update on mountain water the road situation and we do have uh, accumulating snow probable for Thursday afternoon Thursday night um, so we might want to be in a, have to, to do a uh, press conference just to let people know because obviously that weather could, could hamper it will hamper yes, it cleanup will. efforts the road repairs will impact solid waste will impact probably the you all finishing your assessments it will yes um where are we in terms did we get the load of water and cleaning material from the fire commission there it's sitting out there okay so uh, we probably need to get some help from inmates to help clean unload it or are we going to go ahead and take it to belfry to distribute we can uh, take some of it to big creek and take some of it to belfry we've got two big trailers we can haul with let me know and commissioner booth know when that's going to be done because okay. we'd like to make sure that uh, we do our part to let folks know where it's going to be and when we also have um, we also have a load of um, from the churches of christ that's coming tomorrow a 53 foot box trailer uh will be dropped off at uh, the fire station tomorrow about one o'clock so um i've worked working with paul on trying to get a forklift over there and um so it'll be available over there uh, at the fire station as soon as, as soon as it gets offloaded so we'll also have that there the one of the things we talked about just briefly is the belfry road lot has been flooded we got some vehicles damaged over there obviously on a saturday morning couldn't get people out couldn't get vehicles moved the water came up so fast yes we're going to look at relocating the belfry road lot somewhere in belfry obviously but we need to be if you would help us start looking for a piece of property okay commissioner booth's got some ideas if you could get with him okay um potentially up belfry up belfry hollow oh. there but we need to make sure that, our, that you know and how how safe do you think the fire station is your main station there or is that something you're concerned about uh i mean knock on wood we've we've not taken we've had water come up through the drains in 09 uh a little bit uh saturday and it was right to the the north side corner of the building but it, you know we, we didn't get any water so yeah. to this point we've been in pretty good shape but you know it's closer this time than it was in 09 so it's concerning to me yeah. 
because of the uh, I was over in Belfry in 2009 mm -hmm. and saw the damage. Actually, in some ways, there was more damage in 09 because the school got more water in it. Well, yeah, because the pumps uh, failed at the middle school. Um, that's why they. Well, do you think there was more water? I mean, we had water in the complex this time, and we didn't have water. Yeah. Okay. And as these streams and creeks continue to fill up, like Commissioner Booth's right, we're going to continue seeing these. Yeah, and, and I mean, Doug can tell you, most the majority of people said that it was a larger flood than the 09 flood as far as on their properties. Um, you did periodically have somebody here and there say it was a little bit within inches of 09, so they're very comparable as far as... Mm -hmm. um, places that it flooded over there on Pond Creek. Well, Jim, we appreciate it. And uh, just uh, thank you again for what you all have done. Please tell CJ we appreciate his efforts. Well, and well, Connie Martin. Uh, I forgot Connie. Yeah, she Connie is, was a, been a trooper. She's been a real trooper. Uh, she's definitely somebody. She's, she took every call on Sunday by herself. Um, and, uh, yeah, she's uh, – I think she took 80 some calls yesterday yeah. how many alone. rescues did you do saturday uh we did a total of 47 between us big creek and cj um we did 47. pretty, pretty uh yeah pretty shocking no. so we're i think we we're somewhere around uh 22 on pond creek and then there was the 25 that uh were rescued on big creek were pretty much all in sydney missionary baptist church that had a lock-in and uh, they had 25 kids in there, so they had to get them to uh, dry land, uh, which worked out it wasn't very far that they had to move them, but uh, was uh, tough logistics at the time. I can imagine. Thank you all. Thanks. Yeah. All right. Judge Hickman, anything, sir? All right. Um, Mr. Down, anything? Mr. Keene, anything? You want to address that issue about uh, I do judge uh, <clears throat> the judge got a call today uh, from a third party and I did as well and it's terrible what people are going through with the flooding here in the county now but um, the calls we got was about people taking advantage of some of these flooded homes that have been uh, that have been left and you've got people working and we've had some looting uh, happen in the county and I just want to assure the people, I hope these are isolated incidents, but if it continues to happen, that both my office and the Commonwealth Attorney's Office will prosecute these folks to the full extent of the law if we can identify who they are. So if there's any problems or any issues, I want you to call local law enforcement or call my office, and uh, we'll try to get to the bottom of it. And ho hopefully we don't see any more of this. What's your office number over here? Just call me at 794-6212 and I'll route the call where it needs to go. Thank you, sir. All right. Commissioner Tackett, anything, sir? Uh, judge, over the weekend, we'll just, you know, just keep these people, the flood victims, in your prayers. Uh, it was a tough situation over there. It, it didn't look good. Uh, I just want to thank all the people that turned out to help from the county or fire department rescue squad. Uh, I just don't want to leave nobody out, but there was, they was quite a few over there trying to do what they could do. And, uh, you know, I, I want to thank all the fire department rescue squads across this county. Uh, I had a cousin that uh, lost their house uh, not or two before uh, Christmas, and uh, they just wanted me to thank, them, thank the uh, fire departments and rescue squad that came and, and done what they could do. Uh, they, they, they appreciated their, their help. With the, well, they, I mean, they lost their house, but it wasn't the fire department done everything that they could do to uh, to save it. Commissioner Roberts, just want to thank everybody that helped the people in Pike County in the Belfry area. But I mean, it was in my area too, Johns Creek. Uh, Fabian helped me out there. Uh, Yeah, just I like to tell the people out there just to be patient with us. We'll try to get you cleaned up and get the roads clear as quick as we can. It's, uh, you know, we just went through one 
flood and you know we get hit you know get hit again so it's it's hard to recover over all this thank you sir commissioner booth uh judge i'd just like for uh everybody to remember the mccoy family lost butch mccoy on pond creek or butch be surely missed by by over our and uh remember us like I said, just remember all the people that got flooded. Some people lost everything they had. Some people, you know, had other damages, but let's just remember them. I mean, really and truthfully, until we dredge Pond Creek from Tug River to the head of Pond Creek, we're gonna continue to have flooding. I mean, I don't think we need to worry about crawdads and minors. I think from the same way on Big Creek, until you dredge Big Creek from Tug River to the head of Big Creek, you're gonna continue to have flooding because it keeps filling up. Uh, I mean, some talked about raising bridges and raising the roads, but that's not going to help a thing. We just need dredger creeks. And that's all I've got to say, Judge. Well, I mean, the creeks and streams need to be dredged, but it's going to cost a massive amount of money. The federal government's going to A, have to give us permission and come up with the money to do it. I mean, I will say that, yeah, it's, I mean, those from Tug River to the head of Pond Creek and same way on Big Creek, it all falls along the state highway, so, and that, that's federal and state. And I mean, uh, until somebody on that level sees what we need uh, and was willing to come up with the money and do it, these people are going to continue to get flooded every time it rains. Well, I mean, as long as the Army Corps of Engineers and the EPA and these agencies will find you if you kill a crawdad, find you if you put a piece of equipment in the creek, you're never going to fix that. That's right. And, uh, you know, uh, there's no discussion even at the federal level over this issue. And, um, you know, I think you talked to me about a, an area you all used to work when you were yeah. working for the county where you could drive a piece of equipment under a bridge. Mouth, and now it's Mouth of Pico. You could, we used to... In the early 80s, we used to get creek gravel out of the creeks to put on the roads, and the mouth of Pico holler you. We drove an end loader and a dump truck under there and hauled creek gravel all the time, and now it probably ain't six foot tall underneath that bridge, or maybe 10, I don't know, but it's it's all filled in, and it's continued to fill in. And the floods are going to get that much worse. And that's I'm, all across the county. Well, I mean, it, it's all you, across eastern Kentucky. Yeah, yeah you, you can look over here on Cloy Creek. I remember when Joe Wackage could take a backhoe underneath his bridge. Can't hardly crawl under it now. Yeah, it's true. Well, at the mouth of Church House Holler, where it stops up down, we used to get creek gravel out there. You could run an end loader or dump truck underneath that bridge at Church House Holler. And I had a lady say, you know, this was the county's fault that because uh, we don't clean the creeks and streams out. First of all, we can't legally get in the creeks and streams. Second, the cost to clean out the creeks and streams in this county, I would say it would be in the hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, when you start talking about a thousand miles of just county roads, not counting state roads, I mean, you're talking, you're talking a project that has never been attempted anywhere, to my knowledge, of, with that magnitude. And um, these events, are, this is the third one this year, they're going to continue. I really don't have anything else. Anything else? I, I don't have anything to, else to add. I would like to express my condolences to the family of Martin County Judge Executive Victor Sloan. Uh, I've known Victor for a long time. Uh, when I was state senator, represented Martin County. Uh, Victor was a long, long-term magistrate there. Elected five times as magistrate, and back last April. March or April was appointed as uh, judge executive uh, by Governor Bashir when that office became vacant. Uh, I had dinner with him a month or so ago. Uh, all the uh, judge executives in Saad District had dinner. Uh, I had no idea at that time that Victor was that ill. And I would just like to express my condolences to his wife, Marlena, and the rest of the Sloan family uh, Victor was a retired teacher, truly loved Martin County. And uh, again, we want to express our condolences to the Sloan family. Uh, also to the family of Bush McCoy. Uh, Bush was a longtime public servant, great friend to me. 
and uh, he's dearly he's going to dear, be dearly missed. Um, on a more positive note, I would like to uh, express uh, a very uh, heartfelt happy birthday, a hundredth birthday, to Miss Dixie Stevens of Phelps. Uh, 